We have in this morning uh, five presentations, two uh, three before the coffee uh, break and two after the coffee break. And the first speaker will be Stefka Wujukdeva, and she wants to speak about decomposing linear codes over finite fields using the notation groups. Please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first, I would like to congratulate uh, uh, all colleagues with uh, today's uh, Bulgarian holiday. Uh, the second, actually, uh, I had to say the most important uh, for me is to, to congratulate Professor Drensky on his anniversary and to wish him to be healthy and energetic, to be happy with his family and friends, and to continue to create mathematics. And also, I would like to thank him for his support over the year. So thank you, Professor Drensky. And now I will begin with my talk. Uh, this talk is in the area of algebraic coding theory. And uh, I um, tried to, to show the um, structure of linear codes uh, when we use their automorphisms or automorphism permutation groups. Uh, this is a short outline of the talk. Uh, I will start with a short introduction uh, to the main definitions for linear codes. Uh, we consider finite fields with uh, Q elements. Of course, Q is a prime power. And so the n-dimensional vector space over these finite fields. We need a metric in this uh, vector space. So we define Hamming uh, distance and Hamming weight uh, is important for me here uh, of a vector X is uh, the number of its non-zero coordinates. And uh, actually all K-dimensional subspaces of this considered vector space are linear codes. And the parameters of a linear code are N, the length of the code, K, the dimension of the code, and D, minimum weight or minimum distance of the code, where this D of C is the minimum among uh, all weights of non-zero code words uh, of the code C. The vectors in C are code code words. Uh, usually, a linear code is represented by its generator matrix, G, which is a, a matrix with k rows and 10 columns over the considered finite fields whose rows form a basis of the code. Uh, so a linear code can have different uh, generator matrices, which uh, are connected to each other, of course. Uh, I would like also to introduce three special types uh, of linear codes because actually my research is um, connected with these three special types of uh, codes. But to define these codes, uh, I need uh, an inner product in the consider vector space. So if we have a defined inner product in the vector space, then we can define also a linear complement for a, a code C. In, in the usual way. And then this orthogonal complement is also a linear code the, with the same length n, but the dimension is n minus k, when k, where k is the dimension of the code C. And we say that C is a self-orthogonal code if C is a subcode of its orthogonal complement. So we can uh, say here that the intersection of C and C perp is uh, coincides with uh, the code C. Uh, and they have just the opposite situation when we consider LCD codes or linear complementary dual codes, uh, then uh, the intersection of the code with uh, this orthogonal, uh, this, uh, its uh, orthogonal complement uh, consists only of the zero vector. And uh, one special type of code, self-dual codes, a code C is a self-dual if it coincides with its orthogonal complement, uh, of course, uh, the dimension of a self-dual code is always uh, half of its length. And um, actually, most of my research is devoted to self-dual codes, especially. But lately, uh, I uh, work also on this LCD type of codes. OK, uh, to uh, introduce the, this permutation group and how to use them in the study of linear codes, I have to give definitions for equivalence of codes. And I give actually two definitions, uh, which are equivalent to each other. The first definition is um, the, the following, two linear codes of the same length and dimension 
uh, are equivalent if one can be obtained from the other by a sequence of these three permutations. First one, a permutation of uh, these three transformation. First one is the permutation, a permutation of the coordinate positions of all code words. The second one, uh, a multiplication of uh, a coordinate of all code words with a non-zero element of the field. And the third one is applying a field automorphism to all, to all coordinates of all code words. And the sequence of these three transformations that maps the code C to itself is called an automorphism of the code. And uh, of course, the set of all automorphisms for, form a group which is called the automorphism group of the code, denoted uh, usually in this way. Here, the second definition actually, um, the second definition uh, repeats these three transformations but using matrices. And so we say that two codes, C1 and C2, of the same length and dimension again over the, uh, the same field, FQ, are equivalent provided there is a monomial matrix M and an automorphism of the field such that uh, the second code can be obtained from the first one during this, um, using this uh, equality. Uh, this mean that, uh, means that if we take a code word from C1, multiply this code word by the monomial matrix, and then apply all obtained in this way vectors, um, apply uh, an automorphism gamma of the field, then we will have the code C2. And um, here, uh, the monomial matrix actually can be represented as a product of a permutation matrix and a diagonal matrix. And ex exactly this permutational part corresponds to the first transformation here from the previous definition a permutation of the coordinate position. The second diagonal matrix correspond to this second transformation here. Uh, and we have, of course, um, uh, an automorphism of the field. This is an, uh, an element of the Galois uh, group of uh, this field here. But if we have a prime field, the Galois group is trivial. Uh, Okay, let's uh, consider in more deta details the automorphism groups of the codes. Uh, we take a linear code of length n over an arbitrary finite field FQ. Uh, if we consider only the coordinate permutations that map the code C to itself, we obtain the so-called permutation automorphism group of C. And uh, this group is denoted in this way. And of course, it is a subgroup of the symmetric group of order n. Uh, if we consider only the monomial matrices that the map that map uh, code C to itself, these uh, monomial matrices form a group called monomial automorphism group of C denoted in this way here. And we consider all maps uh, of um, as uh, there were in the definition of the form monomial matrix and uh, field automorphism, then we obtain the full automorphism group of the field. And sometimes this full automorphism is denoted by gamma out C or only out C. And uh, as, I, as uh, I already said, if Q is a prime number, then uh, this monomial and uh, the full automorphism groups coincide. And um, if uh, uh, we have binary codes, we consider binary codes, which means codes over field with two elements, then actually these three groups coincide and all automorphisms are permutations. Uh, okay, take now unusual automorphism, uh, an arbitrary automorphism of uh, the linear code we consider. Uh, it is uh, uh, it can be pre uh, presented in, represented in this way permutation matrix multiplied by the diagonal matrix and automorphism of the field here and uh, this important lemma uh, by Kari Kaufman um, uh, gives us the opportunity to consider only permutation automorphisms and this lemma says that if C is a linear code over FQ with an automorphism T of this form of prime order R, we have two restriction for, uh, restrictions for this R, then there exists a code C prime, which is equivalent to C, but for this code C prime, only the permutation matrix here, the permutational part is an automorphism. This, uh, so we can consider uh, in these cases here, only permutation automorphisms. And therefore we focus on these permutation automorphisms. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, such an automorphism can be considered not only as a permutation matrix, but an usual permutation from the symmetric group of order M. And let's see uh, and use uh, then the, the main properties of this permutation. Uh, the most important for us this, is that the permutation can be represented as a product of independent cycles. Uh, okay, let sigma is uh, this such a product. These are the cycles of sigma. Um, and so first we consider the case when um, uh, sigma is a permutation of order R, which uh, has, C and he has C cycles of length R and a fixed point. So this is the first C cycles uh, have length uh, R and these are the fixed points, length one. Okay. And so using uh, this uh, structure of the permutation, actually we can represent our linear codes invariant under such a permutation uh, as a direct sum of two subcodes. The first subcode is, uh, uh, we call it a fixed subcode, is defined in this way. It consists of all code words to which uh, the permutation sigma preserves. Uh, the second subcode is defined in this way here. We consider the restriction, restriction of the vectors in C on uh, all these uh, cycles. And if we take one of these cycles, we want the sum of the coordinates of the vector V on this cycle, and uh, this uh, uh, to be equal to zero. And then this is again a linear subcode of the code C, and C is a direct sum of these two subcodes. Why we need this um, to, to study the structure of, of this uh, of a linear code C, invariant under a permutation, and why we want to obtain uh, smaller subcodes uh, as a building block for this C? The reason is that uh, using this structure, we uh, it is easier to construct such code. We would like to construct and, and also classify codes with some parameters invariant under such permutations. Uh, okay, uh, let's say more about the decomposition. Actually, the second slide will show the decomposition of this uh, second subcode here. Uh, we need this ring here. When the permutation is a order R, we take the ring, which is obtained uh, by factorizing the ring of uh, all polynomials in one variable over the, fin the considered finite field. Uh, on the, the principal ideal generated by this polynomial here, x of degree r minus one. And we need here the factorization of this polynomial into a reducible factor. Factors, we denote these factors by h1 to hs, h0 is uh, this polynomial x minus one. And then we consider principal ideal generated by this polynomials. These principal ideals uh, have uh, generated the impotence denoted, denoted in, this way, uh, in this way. And the next uh, theorem uh, is very important to study also the structure of our code C. Uh, this, uh, this theorem shows the structure of the ring R, actually. Uh, first, what we have is that these ideals defined here are minimal ideals uh, of the ring R. And moreover, the ring is a direct sum of these ideals. Uh, each of these ideals is a field actually with this number of elements shown here. And if we take the generated idempotents, uh, uh, if we have different idempotents, their product is equal to zero. And they are sum, the sum of all idempotents are equal, uh, is equal to one. This decomposition theorem is important because uh, we use it to prove a decomposition of the codes <laughs> later. Uh, we have this permutation represented as a product of independent cycles, the polynomial x of degree r minus one uh, factorized into reducible factors, these ideals, which are actually fields, and the ring r, which is a direct sum of these uh, fields. Uh, then we defined uh, this uh, mm, uh, subcode of uh, our code C. Uh, this code consists of all vector V for which we have the following property, the restriction of the vector V on the uh, cycle omega i belongs to this ideal. 
Uh, and actually the restriction on omega one, the restriction on omega three, the restrictions on all cycles belong to the same ideal here. This is the subcode I, uh, J, E, J. And then the code C is a direct sum of these subcodes. This is the fixed subcode, and this is the direct sum of these um, codes here, defined here. Okay. Uh, the second part of my presentation consists of the corresponding theory for binary codes, especially the case of binary codes I consider here. And so in the binary case, I take first uh, uh, an arbitrary permutation, which uh, preserves the code C of what order R. This uh, not necessarily prime. Uh, this permutation can be represented as a product of independent cycles, but these cycles can have different lengths. Then we have again uh, two sub, uh, subcodes, the fixed subcode, as uh, I defined it before. And uh, this subcode is called the even subcode because here we have the following property the restriction of uh, code word in these subcodes on uh, each cycle has even weight has even weight. And then uh, we have again the same theorem that the code C is a direct sum of the, these two subcodes. But what is new here is that uh, these two subcodes are orthogonal to each other. And, it is, um, and this uh, helps us to consider uh, the structure and the orthogonality conditions, um, uh, not, uh, for, not only for our arbitrarily linear codes, but for codes which are self-orthogonal, self-dual, and uh, linear complementary dual. Uh, what we have for the fixed subcode, the fixed subcode, it is easy to study the fixed subcode, uh, um, uh, actually using that uh, the permutation sigma preserves the code words here. This means that uh, the coordinates in one cycle are equal. And then we can use uh, the projection of this uh, fixed subcode to the vector space uh, of dimension M which uh, M is much smaller than the length of the code C, actually. Uh, we denote this project projection by C pi, and this C pi is again a linear code, but the length of this code is M, much smaller than the length of the code C and the length of this fixed sub uh, subcode. And then we have this uh, theorem, which is important to show them, to see what are the orthogonal properties of uh, this linear code. If C is a binary linear code invariant under the permutation sigma, then the projection of this intersection here of the fixed subcode and its orthogonal complement uh, is equal to the intersection of uh, this projection C pi and its orthogonal complement. And this uh, theorem uh, helps us to prove this uh, uh, corollary here. If C uh, for uh, the linear code, which is a self-orthogonal, for example, if C is self-orthogonal, then this projection code C pi is also self-orthogonal. If C is self-dual, uh, C pi is also self-dual. If C is an LCD code, this C pi is also an LCD, which is interesting because actually self-orthogonal and LCD codes are in some sense uh, uh, opposite to each other as a definition, but in the same time, they share some uh, common uh, properties and uh, common structure. Uh, okay, this color is important when we want, uh, and we see here that uh, uh, if we, we have a C pi, which is a much a code with much smaller parameters, we can construct this fixed part of the code C. And if we have similar properties for the other subcode, we can construct the, codes, uh, the whole code C. But for the even subcode, the, the structure of the even subcode is much more complicated. And therefore, we focus on the case when the order of the considered automorphism is a prime, odd prime. Uh, then uh, this uh, automorphism can be represented as a, uh, as a product of uh, independent cycles, all of length P. And also we have a fixed point here. Uh, considering the restriction of a code word on one cycle of length P, we can correspond to this restriction a polynomial from uh, the set uh, from the ring arm, but actually uh, we consider the ring P of even weight polynomial because these uh, vectors here, this restriction have even weight. 
Uh, okay, and uh, then to any uh, vector from this even subcode, we can correspond a vector from this. Uh, actually, this is not always a vector space, but this is a module P of degree C. Uh, this is the image of the vector V. We take the polynomials from each cycle and the image, we, call the, we denote the image of the, this uh, even subcode by C5. And we would like to know what is the structure of this C5 and how we could use this structure uh, to construct codes. Okay, well, again, we have our ring here. Um, obtained by factorizing this uh, uh, ring of polynomials to this um, on this uh, ideal principal ideal, but here to have more properties and to prove more important uh, for the construction properties, we use um, some uh, more properties of the uh, independent uh, of the irreducible factors of this polynomial, especially we use the following property that this irreducible, we have the x minus one in the beginning, but the other irreducible factors can be considered in two parts. The first part this uh, we have some uh, factors which are uh, self-reciprocal polynomials and the other factors can be divided into uh, pairs and in each pair, the two polynomials are reciprocal to each other. And then, of course, this uh, ring P of even weight uh, polynomials can be represented as a direct sum of corresponding ideals, which are fields, as uh, I already um, presented in a theorem before. But in that, those theorem, I will show you the theorem. Okay, in that theorem, these uh, ideals are denoted by I. Uh, zero, I, one, etc. but we denote now them in different way. In this way, because we, we would I, like I, to... Can I remind that you have still three minutes? Okay. Uh, then uh, we define some subcodes here. And actually this, uh, uh, which depend on these fields and these subcodes are linear codes over the corresponding fields. And then this code C5 is, uh, uh, this image C5 is a direct sum of these linear codes, and we have some uh, uh, formula also also here for the dimension of the codes K uh, C in the beginning taken in the beginning. Okay, and uh, in the uh, to to uh, to have some um, statements for the orthogonality properties uh, on this module here, we use the Hermitian inner product defined in this way, and then we can say some more. Mm, uh, more things about the case when C is an LCD code and when is C is a self-orthogonal code. Then we have these properties for these linear subcodes I showed you before. Okay, uh, I give here some example, but uh, I think I don't have much time for this example. This example is about uh, an LCD code of length 28, dimension 6 and minimum uh, distance 12, uh, having invariant under an automorphism of order 7 uh, with uh, four independent cycles. Uh, then the fixed, uh, actually in this case, the fixed uh, subcode consists only of the zero vector. And for the even, uh, for the even subcode, it has image, which is direct sum of two linear codes over fields with eight elements, which are isomorphic to each other, of course, these two fields, but uh, the elements are represented in different ways. These are the, the uh, generated identities of these two fields with eight elements. And these are generator matrices of this, uh, Mm, uh, linear codes over field with eight elements. Uh, this is my last slide. In the conclusion, <laughs> I would like to say that this was only a basis for the study on the structure of linear codes, having a permutation automorphism that I presented here. And uh, I would like to focus on some, um, only to mention some uh, three uh, particular problems that uh, I have worked on. Uh, the first uh, is that the bi if we consider binary codes having an automorphism of order two, then these codes have completely different structure, which is interesting. I uh, 
have some work studied this structure. And the same holds when we have plots over finite fields with few elements, when the, the, the order of the considered permutation automorphism is not relatively prime to the characteristic of the field. The second problem is uh, that I have studied is that the composition of the binary codes, which have an automorphism of order P square for a node prime, P uses more rings, not only one rings are as I said here, but uh, uses uh, two rings of this type different. And uh, the third particular problem that uh, I um, have worked recently is that um, about LCD codes and uh, this uh, situation that the subcodes of self-orthogonal and LCD codes uh, invariant under a permutation have similar properties. And actually, uh, there is a good uh, theory, a well-known theory uh, developed by uh, Hoffman and Georgov um, for studying the properties, the structure, and constructing and classifying self-dual binary codes uh, using uh, permutation of hot prime order. But we can um, uh, have a similar theory also for LCD codes, not only for self-dual. Uh, okay, this uh, was uh, my talk. Thank you very much for the attention. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for uh, some short questions, please. Is there some questions, please? Uh, yes, please. Mm -hmm. please. Uh, can you uh, tell uh, something more, maybe where we can find the main result about uh, the binary codes with uh, automorphism of order two? Of order two? Actually, this was a part of my dissertation, and uh, I have also a paper in um, not only one, actually, I have uh, three papers uh, published in different journals, and I can, actually, I can uh, send you these papers. Thank you, you very much. Here. Thank you very much. Okay. Other questions, please? If it is not the case, then I want to say thank you again for the speaker, and we have an hour break from only one minute. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, the next speaker is uh, Chemnos Findek, and he wants to speak about the metric uh, poly poly polynomials in non assertive uh, uh, algebras. Please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, hello, my colleagues and uh, my friends from Bulgaria. Well, I'm from uh, Turkey, the warmest city of Turkey, in fact, so I'm sending my warmest uh, regards to everyone in the, in the conference. So before starting my presentation, maybe I should uh, spend some words about Duransky. Well, uh, first of all, I celebrate his 17th anniversary and I wish him longer and healthier life, also uh, connected with the mathematics. Well, uh, in fact, I'm not uh, one of his official PhD students, but I personally uh, feel that he is my advisor because uh, uh, during my PhD studies in one year, for one year, I was in Sofia and 90% of my PhD results are because of him. So before I went, I went there because uh, I went there, I wanted to see how he looks like because in the airport he wanted to meet me. So I, I found this picture from the old website of uh, IMI where everyone looks very official. But uh, during time, I, I have learned that he's also a happy person, especially with Jenya, uh, his wife, and also a sporty person who visited uh, Vitosha Mountain at least for one hour walking and also a supportive person where I had met also Lucio Chantron. So uh, in fact, it was not a really easy time for me in the beginning because I was really with a very poor background in that time. And uh, very much time I, I stuck with many problems, but I was very afraid and shy about asking everything about uh, to him. And I just standing in front of his door in, uh, in IMI 566 and just went back and worked to study. So thank you very much, President Dransky, involving me in the, in, the, in, the, in the Society of Mathematics. So let me start by my presentation now. So we start by uh, fixing some notations uh, where K is a field of characteristics zero, Xn is the finite set of variables, 
and uh, KXN is the polynomial algebra. Uh, FN stands for the free metavalent real algebra. LN uh, will be the free metavalent Leibniz algebra, and the PN for free metavalent Poisson algebra, which was defined recently. So the definition, which is well known, the algebra of G invariance is uh, uh, defined to be the set of all G invariant elements where uh, G invariant elements are the elements uh, which are fixed under the action of every element of a subgroup group G of the, uh, the general linear group. Uh, in 1900, in the Congress of Mathematicians, uh, David Hilbert released 23 uh, questions, one of which was uh, originated from the question that whether or not the G invariant of KXN, the polynomial algebra, is finitely generated. So answers are uh, the partial answers was given until 1956-58, where Nagata showed that in general case it's not correct. But the emulator in 1915 showed that when G is finite, then uh, it is uh, actually finitely generated. So we follow emulator and uh, take a special uh, uh, subgroup, uh, subgroup which is the symmetric group. So we, every, uh, everyone knows that the elementary symmetric polynomials generate the algebra of uh, the algebra of SN invariance, which is also uh, which can be also named like the uh, the algebra of symmetric polynomials. So uh, how to move inside the uh, inside the non-commutative uh, invariant theory? So when you when you when you check for the polynomial algebra in M variables. It's, it looks like that it is the free algebra uh, in the uh, in the variety of uh, commutative associative algebras. So the potential candidates might be uh, free or relatively free non-associative non-commutative algebras. For example, Lie algebras or Leibniz algebras. So in 1994, as a result of Dransky, we know that the free metavalent Lie algebra to the G, which is the algebra of the variant of G, is never finitely generated when G is the finite. Uh, subgroup of the general linear group. So uh, in here, the uh, the main the key point is the metavalian variety. This is why it's good to work in in the free metavalian Lie algebra. So uh, it is not finitely generated as an algebra, although we can have some uh, proper actions of G X and G uh, such that as a module of uh, this algebra, it is finitely generated. So free metal algebras are well known uh, from the book by Bakhtarin that the, it has a very nice looking uh, basis. So here the, in, in, uh, the adjoint elements can be uh, uh, here, uh, adjoint operators are commutative here. This is why F, uh, the commutator ideal F, F prime is a, a right KXN module. So in this module, we can work very easily. So we started by working with uh, rank two uh, with uh, a colleague of mine, who is my next door friend. Uh, and we, start, uh, we found a minimal infinite set of uh, symmetric polynomials in uh, free metal algebra. So uh, how to move? So we moved a little bit more with rank three uh, and we show that there is also a nice expression, but which is not that much uh, easy. So you see here, uh, uh, Q is easy to express, but R is not that easy. So it looks like exactly this way. And uh, somehow we wrote the paper and sent to Turkish Journal of Mathematics. And uh, the referee report was really interesting. The referee report, in the referee report, the referee showed for any N greater than or equal to two. So it was like nine pages of full text uh, providing us writing uh, all of the results. So I checked the referee report and the language and the quality of the report. And I guessed that it should be in fact Dransky. So I wrote him that whether or not he is the referee and he, he, uh, he said, yes. So uh, I wanted to add his name also to, uh, uh, to this paper but the original mathematics was not okay. So we, we sent it to another uh, 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 paper, uh, another uh, journal with three names that 
we have uh, the all of the generators uh, as a KXN SN model. So these generators are finite number of generators. It is n choose two, uh, but the implicit description are given in here. So here, as you see, uh, H I J N are the elements inside the um, uh, read product. So let me go back because the order is not correct, correct in here. So uh, by Schmelkin, we can uh, we can embed all of the elements of uh, F and prime, which is the computer ideal in inside the read product. So it's very lo uh, well looking thing in here. So if you have something in here, then you can pull it back. So these implicit uh, generators are giving all of the results for us. So as an as an illustration, maybe I can I can show you one of the uh, things in here. So wait, let me let me close the climate here. So we still have a, a, a air conditioner because it's like thirty five Celsius degree in here. Another sorry. So here, uh, first of all, we have uh, we have uh, uh, we express everything in, in here, and then uh, co coefficient of u two, u three, u four, and all together we should rearrange everything in order to get the, uh, the, 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 the the desired form of the elements in here. So you see here, because of the embedding, it is x two, x one, and x three, x one, and so on, so on, and you get exactly the result in here. So maybe as uh, as an example, we should give uh, uh, some 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 results. For example, in NB two, where we did with Obushlu uh, as an algebra as infinite gener generated elements. So we have only a single element in here as a module structure. So as a module structure for NB three in here, you have th three elements. Uh, when you have four, you have six elements, three is uh, fits here and three in another place in here. So <clears throat> these are the results that we can get uh, for free metabolian Lie algebras. So what are other al algebras? Sorry, uh, is there any questions in here? No, sorry. So we here uh, uh, can consider some generalizations of the algebras, for example, Leibniz algebras or Poisson algebras, uh, some other algebras, including the algebras as elements. So Poisson algebras are given in this way, uh, which can be found in many papers, in many books. Uh, but the, the basic concept of the three, uh, concept of metabolian algebras was given in 2015. And uh, just four years later, four years later, uh, Zeng Chen Bokut gave a, a very nice property of uh, three Poisson algebra of rank N, and even they gave a uh, basis of them. So free, uh, free metabolic and Poisson algebras uh, having this, this, this type of basis. So uh, focusing on the first part, uh, we, can, we can see that this is uh, coinciding with the free metabolic and Lie algebra, and all others uh, are with non-Li elements, non, uh, saying non-Li, I mean that we don't have a, we, uh, we have also dot uh, multiplication in here. So uh, also uh, in each part, in each uh, com uh, okay, next, next. in each part you have um, K B I N uh, uh, subspaces are uh, SN invariant spaces. This is why it's uh, in order to get all of the uh, symmetric polynomials in Poisson algebras, it's sufficient to work in, in each one separately. So uh, because we, we already did some results in here, it's enough to work with, with the, these other three places. So with a, with a student of mine and a, a colleague of mine, we did some, uh, we gave some result. The subspace of this uh, remaining three parts uh, are, uh, 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 as a vector space, as a basis, Bn, which contains uh, eight types of uh, polynomials. In, in the first five part, it comes from the polynomial algebra, and it, the other parts are coming from B3, B4. So what are they? These are, as in here, so P1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is easy, and 6 and uh, 7 and 8 are the new elements uh, which are coming from non the Poisson algebras. Uh, also, we can give some monthly elements uh, as an explicit generators in here. 
for n being four also. We have uh, many, many computations in here. Also for Leibniz algebras, for three Metroidian Leibniz algebras, because of Dransky, we know that uh, we know a, a, a basis of it. And uh, by this basis, it, uh, it's complete ideal is the right, is the right KRN, KRN module. So KRN means that we, we multiply the elements from right side. Okay, here right and left uh, the first because uh, in, the, in, the, in the Leibniz algebras, we do not have uh, uh, anti-symmetry. This is why uh, we work in this way and we get a very complicated uh, result, which is not nice. But how to get the, 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 the generators? For n being two, we have a result. When uh, rank is two, then we get, we get this result such that we have x1, x1 plus x2, x2 and uh, uh, x1, x1 minus x2, x2, l1 minus r2, which means we multiply uh, uh, from right side x1 minus x2, and so on, so on. Uh, well, is it uh, compatible with the result we get before? Well, uh, if, you, if, you, if you divide it in the, in the annihilator, then here becomes zero, here becomes zero, here uh, also becomes zero. Here, we get two times x, uh, x1, x2 times x1 minus x2, which is compatible with the result we get in here, where uh, for pre metabolian algebras on rank two, we have this element. So as a generalization, the results are compatible and uh, it's good looking. So how to do with, with the more ranks? So for more ranks, we are still working on it, but uh, we haven't gotten any, any result yet. Uh, anyway, so these are the non-associative results. So how about non-commutative uh, non results. So we, we start by the, by, the, by the variety G generated by the Grassmann algebra containing uh, all of the associative algebra satisfying this, this uh, Grassmann identity. So Dransky gave uh, also a, a basis in here. So this basis uh, helps us uh, very much when rank is two or three. So when rank is greater than or uh, equal to four, then uh, the, the, the commutator ideal is not a left uh, polynomial model. So for n being two, three, we get some results. So when uh, n is two, then the prime uh, the symmetric polynomials are generated by on a single element in here, which is very different like the primitive than the algebra. Uh, and when rank is three, then we get three, three different elements in here, which are also the free elements, three generators. Another approach is that we may get two, three uh, traces, generic matrices, and we may have the, uh, the, uh, the associative algebra W of them, and also the Lie subalgebra L of them. So we already have some results about that, such that Transky and Korsikov gave a presentation of this algebra. Le Brun gave that the uh, it is the it, uh, in the center uh, is generated by T U V, which are the uh, algebraic independent elements, and uh, with Transky we have that for L prime, it is it is generated by three elements in here. So using all of these results, we can also get the symmetric polynomials in here. That uh, uh, W uh, the symmetric polynomials in W are uh, generated by these elements as a K T U B T U B S two module, and the uh, L prime is generated by these three elements, uh, which are also the three generators. Okay, what is this? In here we have T D is already uh, a symmetric polynomial, so this is T plus U T times U and V uh, if you giving us the results. So. I wanted to be a little bit fast because I, I was afraid that uh, I will not fulfill the time. Uh, so this is the end of my uh, presentation. I want to thank you all. Special thanks to my, my friends in, in the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sure, we have enough time for questions and remarks, please.
looks like there is no questions, no remark. So then I want to say thank you once again for the speaker. And I think it's time, it's time for the next talk. Next talk is from uh, Boya Kostandinov uh, for, uh, uh, from uh, Sofia University. And he wants to speak about the stability and solidity base for the generalized client on Hattrick equations. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I was going to say uh, good morning to everyone, but uh, I guess uh, we are most of us in different time zones, so I just uh, say hello to everyone, including everyone who's here in the, at the conference. So, um, as you can see, the result is, uh, let's say, far from most of the talks that are in this presentation. So, I thought it would be good if I just uh, emphasize on the historical background of the problem and then uh, provide the more details on the results that uh, we have. Uh, the results here are um, mutual collaboration between Kurt uh, Rekov and Rekov Taruri from the Technical University of Sofia. Uh, so, uh, okay, so what, uh, what we do is actually we consider the so-called generalized the klein gordon equation, uh, which is given uh, in this form. I'm not going to uh, pronounce it out, out loud just because it take, will take time. Uh, but in brief, uh, WT means the second uh, partial derivative in time. D uh, is the Laplacian operator, and the asterisk here is the convolution. Uh, I must admit that this is something which uh, I should have provided here as information, but I, apparently I missed it. Okay, so as I said, we consider the dimension which is uh, greater than or equal to three. Uh, we also take the parameter to be greater than or equal to two, and uh, the other parameter alpha is uh, between the limits in the limits between uh, zero and n. Uh, roughly speaking, is that uh, if we take this uh, solitary wave or just or this uh, solitary wave solution and plug it in this klein gordon hartree equation, we will get this uh, equation, which we also uh, call the euler lagrange equation. Uh, we also consider the stability, the notion of stability in the classical sense. Uh, we will see the formal definition later in the presentation, but as a moment, I can just uh, say that uh, uh, what stability means is um, the fact that if we have um, initial data, to the euler lagrange equation, and if we have a solution to, the, to this equation, and if the solution to the second equation is close to this initial data, and if another condition, the solution that corresponds to this initial data remains close to this solitary wave solution, then we say that U is stable. Otherwise, we, stay, we say that U is unstable. Uh, so, one of the important results in this area is the result by Chata, which is from uh, 1983. In his paper, he considers uh, the, a more general, general form of this uh, equation and, pro and proves that uh, solitary, wave, solitary waves, which minimize the energy functional, uh, actually mm, are, are solitary waves. So, <clears throat> Uh, he also considers um, this equation, uh, this equation, which, as we can guess, uh, is derived from the previous one in, in the same way that uh, we have just discussed. Uh, those of you who are more familiar in physics, which uh, unfortunately are not, uh, they, they might know that um, this question, uh, this uh, equation arises in particle physics, and it actually models the particles with uh, spin zero. Uh, so uh, continuing with uh, the same uh, result uh, by Shata and Anderson, uh, we can say that uh, the last one shows numerically that they are stable standing waves, meaning that they are both stable and unstable standing waves, where he considers the non-linearity, non which is given by this expression here. 
uh, what what also what Chetan also proves is uh, that the fact that his functional here is uh, convex and this leads to the fact that uh, we have the stability of those standing waves. A, sim a similar result was uh, considered, uh, sorry, the, the problem was also considered by Lee and um, he also arrives at this uh, result by using the principle of uh, the least energy. Uh, so uh, again, we are interested in, in we are interested in finding the so-called ground states solutions in which uh, minimize the energy functional. The question of existence of such solutions is considered by a number of authors, uh, where we can outline uh, Strauss, Berestitsky, Lyon, Shetash, Kuber, Amoros, Banshaft, Gen, Benkov, Genev, Yuriev, Stefanov, and many more, of course. That was just an overview of uh, what we have as, uh, as background information. So uh, another result that is important to us that uh, we use is uh, the paper by uh, Jean Li Wu and who studied the classical case when the dimension is three and the parameter is two, and the parameter p is two. So uh, if I have to summarize the the entire result in, uh, in a few sentences, I would say that uh, we use the result given by Shata and apply it to the approach used by those four guys here to prove that the standing waves for our generalized climate board and heart equation <coughs> are stable. So to go, let's say, uh, in the direction of our results is uh, that uh, we consider this uh, functional S omega, uh, which is given by uh, this expression here, where D is the so called uh, Coulomb energy. And actually, this is uh, a sort of the, it's not the sort of say, a little bit the uh, conclusion that we saw in the beginning where I mentioned that uh, I couldn't uh, write it explicitly. So the dysfunctional is well defined in the case when the parameter p uh, is given in this interval, and this is uh, due to the or using the Guillain-Nirenberg uh, inequality, which uh, provides this relation here. Uh, so to now, if we want, now if we want to define the ground the, the ground states, we can first of all define the set m omega, which consists of all functions u. From H1, okay, again, something which I have missed to outline is uh, H1 is uh, Hilbert space, which uh, consists of uh, all functions uh, whose derivatives up to order one belong to the L2 space. And in the, those functions, functions U, are actually critical points to the minimizer, to uh, are critical points or minimizers. Uh, to the functional S omega. So uh, the, eventually the set of all ground states actually consists of uh, functions U from the set M omega, such that the value of functional S in those functions is, is less than or equal to the value of S in, in every other function V from the set M omega. Uh, we can, uh, we need to also uh, just briefly mention that uh, using uh, Schwartz symmetrization or also called standard symmetrization, uh, we can prove that uh, the solution, that the, these uh, stable, these standing waves can be represented in this way, where the function Q omega is, uh, a decreasing positive and radial solution of the Euler Lagrange equation. Uh, we also prove the availability or, or the presence of the Pujayev in a identities, uh, which is something that uh, has been proved many times before. We just provide uh, more like a, more an alternative proof in this direction. Uh, so we can consider an organization problem of this form. Uh, minimizing this functional here 
where we set the group energy p equal to m to the power of p over p minus one. Um, again, again, this is just uh, for informational purposes. The the fact that the ground states minimize the solution of uh, oops, sorry uh, of this problem here is uh, standard and it's uh, provided in in many papers. So I think it's not worth spending time on it. Uh, if we set u in this way, and if we also um, and where actually mu is given as uh, an infinite of this minimization problem, uh, we can. It's easy to check or to prove that actually uh, the infinite of um, this minimization problem equals mu to the power p over p minus one. Uh, so we can, if we consider the um, another, it's again a similar minimization problem where we want to find the integral of uh, s omega when uh, the Coulomb energy is given in this way. This is um, basically the approach that is used by Jean Lee, Wu, and Pacheta, and the one that we also apply. It's easy to see and to check that uh, this minimization problem here and the one that we have just seen are similar, uh, which makes let's say easy to compute or to to find the what's the infimum or solution to this simulation problem q which is given by pi p minus one over p times p times mu to the power p over p minus one uh, so if we also use and apply the um identities uh, we can further compute the value of uh, S omega in uh, in a standing wave solution. Extending further <laughs> our approach, uh, we can compute d of omega and find that it's, it equals to this expression here. Now, if we use the scaling property of uh, all the Lagrange equation, it, this is uh, a bit technical, so it's not worth spending too much time on it. Uh, we can Compute and have uh, this uh, relation here, where we eventually compute d of omega equals to this expression here times uh, i sub zero from u sub zero. Uh, this is the, the purpose of all these, uh, let's say, exercises were to find an explicit way or explicit form of d of omega, since what we need is actually its second derivative and. Um, and we want to determine the interval or the values of omega where the second derivative is uh, strictly positive. Now, this is easy since um, e, uh, I, of I sub zero is uh, strictly positive. Then we can compute the first derivative and the second derivative. And then the following uh, lemma provides uh, or actually answers the question when is the second derivative uh, should be positive or, alter or alternatively when d of omega is convex. So it's given by, uh, by this interval here. Um, now, again, we uh, basically work, we work in the energy space where we consider the H1 space, the Hilbert space, and the L2 space functions. Uh, so another result that, uh, that we have is that, that uh, we prove the conservation of uh, laws, the energy law and the law of charge. And we also affirm, confirm that uh, we have uh, the, the so-called um, the, the blow up the, the blow up of the alternative. <laughs> So uh, again, uh, now this is the formal definition of, um, of stability, which again says that if we have initial data, which is close to a solution to the oral branch equation, and if the solution that corresponds to this initial data remains, remains close to this solitary wave solution, then we say that uh, you, 
or the set g omega is stable. Otherwise, we say that it's unstable. Speaking either of uh, g omega or um, the, the solutions you have. Uh, so uh, we can um, to further consider we can uh, take a look at this uh, d of omega by setting up in, in this way. This is an alternative way of um, setting this functional where we can uh, write it down in in this way. Again, this is uh, some, it takes some technical steps which uh, I'm going to put it here. And basically, we move a set of simple lemmas uh, which actually lead us to the final uh, result. So the first lemma provides uh, information about uh, or information. I mean, it provides uh, um, assessment of uh, of D in two different points where these two different points are, are actually close to one another. Uh, so again, uh, continuing with, uh, with, with the results, we, we have we establish another a lemma which provides information about uh, or another assessment uh, of the energy, the charge, and again the second derivative of uh, d omega, which takes us to the to the final result where we were using all of the above. We prove the fact that uh, the set of ground states g omega is uh, stable. Uh, so. Uh, yes, that's actually the end of uh, the talk. And before I let's say, provide the hand it over to you for any questions or comments, um, I will just say why am I here? Because probably most of you will be wondering um, what is such a topic, what is such a topic has to do with uh, combinatorial theories. Is well, the fact is that I I, I was uh, let's say student or Mr. Uh, he was my thesis advisor. Uh, during my master's degree and actually he was the person who paved my way to science and showed me how to do it so uh, i will be always grateful for all his help and support and i wish him at least uh, two or three times uh, anniversaries of 70 years so that's that's all for me and, uh, yeah please Um, so thank you very much for your pre uh, present uh, for your presentation and now we have still time for questions and remarks please okay this is not a, a case. I don't see any people want to say some things. And I want to say uh, once again, thank you for the presentation. And okay, I think we can continue our uh, one exit uh, uh, session. We have still two presentations. Uh, the next one is from. Angela Valenti, she wants to speak about meta abelian varieties and left nilpotent varieties, please. Thank you. Just a moment. To the... Okay. Um, first of all, I want to thank the organizer for uh, <clears throat> the opportunity to attend this conference. And I want to congratulate to with Wesselin for his anniversary. Many wishes, Pesedin. So, in um, this talk, we deal with um, varieties of non associative algebras, and in particular with commutative or anti commutative metabian varieties and the left nilpotent varieties of index 2. In um, recently, with uh, Mishenko, we constructed the correspondence between these two varieties that uh, allowed us to transfer property of left nilpotent varieties to metabelian varieties. So let's start by recalling some well known result. So V will be a variety of non necessary associative algebra over a field of characteristic zero. 
if we did not by the entity of V, the TADL of polynomial identities of V, a by PN, the space of multilinear polynomials in the first N variables, then we can define the nth dimension of the varieties of the variety, that is the dimension of the quotient space PN modulo the multilinear identities. So in, uh, in the early 70, REGEF proved that uh, for uh, the non-trivial variety V of associative algebras, then the nth dimension is exponentially bounded. For varieties of non-associative algebra, this is, uh, the situation is much more involved. And uh, by result of Bakhtulin and Bransky, we know that if V is a variety generated by finite dimensional algebra, then the nth codimension is exponentially bounded. But in general, this codimension has over exponential growth. This was first proved by Vodyshenko for variety of the algebra satisfying the following identity. Then uh, Petrogransky, constructed an interesting scale over exponential function between, uh, between exponential and factorial, behaving like the codimension sequences of a suitable the algebras. And by result of Drensky and Giambuno Zelmanov, um, we know that there are varieties of Jordan algebra with over exponential growth. Um, the um, rate of uh, the growth of the sequence of codimension was uh, for varieties of associative algebra was found by John Bruno Zeshef, who proved the existence of this limit uh, and the integrality. This is also true for any finite dimensional D algebra and uh, the result is due to Zaisef. But uh, um, this is not an expected behavior for uh, the algebras. In fact, even when the codimension sequence is um, exponentially bounded, the uh, exponential rate of growth can be not an integer, and this was proved by Mishenko and Zaisef, who constructed the algebra with non-integral exponential growth of the codimensions. This result was extended by Mishenko to variety of the algebras generated by a simple infinite dimensional the algebra of Cartan type. And uh, Gian Bruno Shestagov and Zaisef proved the existence and the integrality of the exponent for varieties of finite dimensional simple algebras. Let's now consider the variety of left potent algebra of index 2, that is the variety determined by this identity. By a result of Drensky, we know that if V is a variety of associative or, or D or Jordan algebra, was the sequence of codimension is polynomially bounded, the nth codimensions asymptotically behaves like CN to K, where C is a constant and K is an integer. Um, anyway, for uh, um, our variety, this is not more true. And uh, Mishenko and Zaisef, for any really number alpha between three and four, um, proved the existence of sub-variety of our variety such that for large n, the nth dimension of B alpha is greater than C1 n to alpha and less than C2 n to alpha where C1 and C2 are positive constant. So in particular, the limit of the logarithm of the Cn B alpha is equal to alpha. So motivated by this result, um, with Mishenko, we asked if a similar phenomenon can appear for any real number alpha less than three. So we looked at the problem of classify of possible growth of varieties B such that the entity dimension is bounded by Cn to alpha, 
with alpha between zero and three real number. And we obtained the following result. For variety of non necessary associative alpha and associative algebras, if alpha is between zero and one, then for n large, the identical dimension mm. must be less or equal to n. For variety of commutative or anti-commutative algebras, if alpha is greater or equal to one and less than two, then either, wow. Then either the entity dimension is less or equal to one or the limit of the logarithm of the entity dimension of V is equal to one. For uh, varieties, uh, um, of left nilpotent algebra of index 2, oh. we proved that if alpha is greater or equal to 1 and less than 2, then alpha must be equal to 1. And for alpha between 2 and 3, alpha must be equal to 2. So um, this says that, that there are no uh, varieties of left nilpotent algebra of index 2 with uh, uh, fractional polynomial growth. Instead, uh, by the result of Mushenko and Zaisef, we know that there exist such varieties uh, for alpha between 3 and 4. Um, so next step was to investigate similar phenomena for varieties of metabelian algebra, algebras. So we found a correspondence between the varieties of left nilpotent algebra index two and varieties of commutative and anti-commutative metabelian algebras. And we proved that the previous result for uh, also um, old for varieties of commutative or anti-commutative metabelian algebras. In particular, we constructed a metabelian commutative or anti-commutative algebra and the left nilpotent algebra of index two that share the same behavior of the sequence of co-dimensions. Let's see how to construct these uh, algebras. So let A be a left nilpotent algebra of index two and let A zero be the right annihilator of A. We consider a basis of A zero and then we complete this basis to a basis of the wall algebra. Since the AIs are in the right annihilator, of course, we have that the product of AIJ and BIJ is equal to zero. But uh, we require this special condition that also the product of the BIs are equal to zero. So from uh, the identity X, Y, Z equivalent to zero, it follows that the product of AI, BJ is in A zero. Now uh, we construct an algebra with the same basis and with almost the same um, the table of multiplication only will require that AIBJ is commutative or anti-commutative, so BIIJ is not equal to zero. So let A plus or A minus the algebra with the same basis and with the following multiplication table. So this uh, algebra satisfies the identities x, y, z, t equivalent to zero and x, y equal y, x or minus y, x. So is a metabelian commutative or anti-commutative algebra. Then uh, we compared the nth dimension of the whole algebra A uh, of these algebras. So, and we proved that the nth dimension of A plus or A minus is um, less or equal than the nth dimension of A, a greater or equal than the half of these codimensions, this codimension. Vice versa, if we consider 
we start with metabelian commutative or anti-commutative algebra. We consider with an opt by a zero plus or minus the span of all the products of elements of our metabelian algebra. We consider a basis of this span and we complete this basis to a basis of a plus or a minus. So since a plus a minus is metabelian, it follows that a i a j is equal to zero and the product of the other elements are commutative or anti-commutative belongs to a zero. Then we construct an algebra A with the same basis and with the following multiplication table. We require that bi aj is equal to zero. So uh, this algebra satisfies the identity x, y, z equivalent to zero, and so is a left in important algebra of index two. Also in this case, we compare the codimension and we found that the nth codimension of A is between the nth codimension of uh, the metabelian algebra two times this codimension. From uh, this relation between the codimensions, it follows that there are no varieties of commutative or anti-commutative metabelian algebra such that the sequence of codimension is bounded by Cn to alpha with alpha between one and two and two and three. In fact, if we will assume that this variety exists, then as a consequence, we, it follows that uh, there exist varieties of left in important algebra index to with such property, and this is impossible. Um, also in this case, we can give an example of varieties of metabelian algebras with the fractional polynomial growth between three and four. This is an example. Let W equal to W1, W2, Wm be an associative word over the alphabet 0, 1. Let AW, the algebra with basis A, B, Z1, Z2, Zm plus 1, satisfying the following relation. The product of Zi and A is a commutative or anti-commutative and is in the it is equal to one minus wi zi plus one. Also the product of zi beta uh, b is a commutative or anti-commutative and, and is equal to wi zi plus one. And all other products are equal to zero. So for any positive in integers m and s with s less or equal than the square root of m plus one, we denote by WMS the word of length m such that in the S and in the M position, the letter are equal to one and, on, and all other letters are zeros. So we uh, consider the algebra AM that is the direct sum of the algebra AWM plus one, AWM plus two, until AWM, their uh, integral part of the square. And we are not by VM, the variety generated by this algebra. And we consider the, variety, the union of all these varieties for M greater than one. So uh, this variety, it is, is a variety of a commutative or anti-commutative metabelian algebra. And it is possible to show that for any n greater or equal than 25, the nth co-dimension of V, for the nth co-dimension of V, we have this, this equality. Um, so V that has uh, as a polynomial growth 
uh, asymptotically equal to n 3.5. Just to finish, uh, we know that in case of uh, varieties of associative or Lie algebras, no uh, intermediate growth and no, and no exponential growth between one and two is allowed. For uh, this variety, the situation is different. In fact, by Gianbruno uh, Mischenko and Zaisef, proved that for any real number alpha between zero and one, there exists a sub-variety of, of our variety, such that the sequence of codimensions behaves like n to n to alpha. And for any real number beta greater than one, there exists a sub-variety such that the exponent is equal to beta. So since it is... Uh, uh, varieties uh, um, since in the, in the construction of these varieties uh, were considered the left and important algebra of index to satisfying the required condition um, from the relation between the identical dimensions it follows that the exponent of A is equal to the exponent of the, the metabelian algebra. So as a consequence, we obtained the same for commutative or anti-commutative metabelian algebra. So we have that for any real number alpha between zero and one, there exists a variety of commutative or anti-commutative metabelian algebra such that the sequence of co-dimensions behaves like n to n to alpha. And for any real number beta uh, greater than one, there exists a variety of metabelian algebra such that the exponent is equal to beta. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I finished. Thank you very much for your presentation. Now we have time for questions, remarks, and thoughts. Please. Is there, I cannot see some things. So I want to say thank you again for the presentation. Now, okay, I think it is time for the last presentation before the, the lunch break. And the speaker will be Lucio Centrone, and he wants to speak about Nowitzki's uh, con uh, conjecture and about. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, the organizers, for this opportunity. Let me spend some words toward the uh, Veselin. When I was at the very beginning, um, uh, Veselin was my superhero. Uh, someone conjectured that the name of my first uh, son should be Veselin. He is still my uh, superhero. Uh, anyway, I started to know him personally and I, I saw several qualities. I would like to highlight among all his humility when uh, he shared uh, some parts of his private lives with me, with my family, with my original, my original family and uh, my wife. So I would like to thank him because he was crucial in my life. So let us uh, talk about mathematics and I would like to speak about, talk about Novisky's conjecture. It was one of uh, the teams uh, in which Veselin worked in uh, this la last 20 years. So, uh, let me start with some historical framework. Uh, we have in our notation, K will be a characteristic, characteristic zero field. We consider the community polynomial algebra in N variables. And we consider the linear group GLN and some subgroup. Some polynomial is said to be H invariant if it's preserved under this action. The space of all H invariants is an algebra and is called the algebra of H invariants. This is um, classical, this is a classical definition from invariant theory. So uh, 
The question is when this algebra of invariance is finitely generated or not for every subgroup of the linear group. Of course, this is a special case of a 14 Silbert problem. Uh, we everybody knows here uh, Nagata gives a counterexample to Hilbert's question. But of course, I would like uh, we would like to remark some affirmative cases. In this talk, I would like to speak about the approach of Weizenbach. He considered luckily in a potent linear derivation of the algebra of uh, KXN, and he considered its kernel, the kernel of the derivation. This is an algebra called algebra of constant of KXN. In his work, he showed that his, this algebra is finitely generated as an algebra. And of course, this is equal to the algebra of invariance of this unit triangular group. You can see the definition here below. Maybe you, everybody can, can see it. Okay, the next question is what, what is the face of uh, these generators? In one of his book, now the name Novisky appears for the first time here, conjecture that this algebra KXN, YN, we are simply considering uh, YN, some uh, new variables YN, is generated by X1, XN, and these guys here, uij, xi, yj, minus xj, yi, assuming that the derivation is so that uh, yi goes to xi and xi goes to zero. Okay, this is what we are called in this talk, friendly, Navisky conjecture. Okay, this conjecture was proved uh, affirmatively by Curie in his PhD thesis by Dransky, uh, with a joint work with Makarlimanov, Kuroda, Petrituk, Petrituk, and many other, many other uh, mathematicians using different techniques. We would like to see uh, uh, in this talk, I would like to show some results and open, open problems to work this problem. Okay, I uh, would like to, to show a generalize, some generalization of uh, Novisky conjecture. So we take an integral domain over a field, a set of variables, uh, community, and uh, we consider the algebra dyn, a derivation delta on this algebra A said to be elementary if it sends the element of the uh, integral domain to zero and the variables yi's to uh, some elements of D. We also introduce these new objects here that are called determinants. This is simply the cross product of these variables. They, they are constant. The question, which is the generalized in viscous conjecture is, is this algebra generated by these determinants? Of, of course, the, the question I've, uh, I've posed right now is exactly in a viscous conjecture when you choose as a, an integral domain kxn, we, you put this uh, delta going to uh, sending delta uh, d to zero and the yi's to xi for the remaining variables. Uh, and in the proof book of uh, Curry, the author considered uh, the, the following derivation, sending yi to the powers of the xi's. In this case, the algebra of constants of these algebras is generated by xn's, so the variables belonging to the integral domain and the determinants. Uh, in this line, the, um, it seems that the most general result uh, is due to Puroda, and this is exactly the following one. You take this elementary derivation, sending the yi to uh, fi, where fi's are element of d. Uh, um, of course, this d in this case is still the cakes and the uh, polynomial algebra, community polynomial algebra. And suppose for the, uh, the fi's are algebraically independent. Then the algebra of constant is generated by the determinants. 
if D is flat over K, the, the, the algebra generated by F1, Fn. Of course, this results is different from the original version of Novisky conjecture from a philosophical point of view. Novisky's conjecture can be restated in uh, the language of classic and invariant, uh, but uh, instead of Kuroda, Kuroda result, um, in, in the case, the FIs are not linear. Okay, in uh, 2000, 2020, Dransky proved the, proved the following. Again, uh, again, an uh, elementary derivation of this dyn, so that delta sends the yi's to fi uh, to some polynomials, linear polynomials, non-constant. Then this algebra of constant is generated again by xn and the determinants. Oh, in all these results above, the determinants uh, the generator of the algebra of constant are not supposed, uh, are not three generators. So in all these works I've cited above, a big part of the, of the, uh, of the paper deals with uh, finding a set of three generators. So uh, we, we go back, we go to the uh, main topic of this uh, conference about uh, polynomial identity, uh, algebras with polynomial identities. So uh, simply in this slide, I would like to introduce polynomial identity. So I, maybe I will skip it. So simply, uh, I will, we will uh, talk about general identities, Lie identities, Jordan identities, associative algebras. So let me skip this, this slide. Okay, uh, uh, the, the goal is generalizing the viscous conjecture to a relatively free algebra. We will do this in, uh, in the following way. Consider the free algebra X and Y n with the derivation sending again xi to zero and yi to the xi's. We choose an algebra from this variety, I mean, Lie algebra, Jordan algebra, associative algebra. Uh, uh, the ideal of identity is delta invariant and uh, induce a derivation on the relatively free algebra. And the question is, is the algebra of constant of the relatively free algebra in, in, uh, finally generated? Are these generators uniformly looking? Are they close to B determinants? We, in order to answer to this problem, we take uh, an algebra in one, uh, any algebra, and we consider the variety generated by this algebra. And we have the complete answer. It is a joint. Uh, uh, a combined combination of two words. Take a variety of associative or Lie algebra, take an algebra with derivation. The algebra constant of A is not finally generated, depending on the fact that the algebra of upper triangle two by two matrices belongs or not to the variety. This is the, the war result. So, in associative case, uh, UT2 plays prominent rule minimal variety of exponent two. So I uh, uh, would like to show some particular cases. And we start off with the Grassmann algebra in finite dimension Grassmann algebra, which of course plays an important role in PI theory. Uh, first of all, from the uh, structural point of view, everybody, everybody knows, you know, everybody involved in PI theory knows uh, the T ideal of uh, of any associative algebra with a field characteristic zero is the TA deal of the Grassmann envelope of finite dimensional super algebra. So that's, this is the structural uh, force, uh, strength point of the infinite dimensional Grassmann algebra. Okay, we define this object inside this, this algebra. Uh, of, of, uh, we will also change notation. We will call S and A the infinite dimension of Grassmann algebra and variables X and Y n. And we define here some uh, determinately uh, uh, determinant looking objects. The first one is a determinant. The second one and the third one are closed to be determined. All of these objects 
are constant in uh, the relatively free algebra. Now we set U as the set of determinants, the W0, Z0 are the set of all this W, I, J, K and Z, I, J, K, L. And we also set W, S, uh, w, S and Z, S as the set of, uh, how to say, of these guys here. Again, W, S and Z, S are constants. And for S, for S uh, greater than or uh, greater than or equal to D, also US and W uh, US and WS are zeros. The result, uh, due to myself and Shagmus Findik, is that the algebra of constant of the relatively free algebra of the Grassmann algebra is generated by the previous defined U, W, L, Z, L, where L is uh, less than or equal to N minus one and by the Xn. So we have something more than determinants. We have some uh, different, uh, uh, different objects. Of course, by the results cited above, this guy should be finally generated. But as I told you before, these guys, the, the, the algebra of constants cannot be recovered by determinants and the constants and the exam. But of course, the generators are uniformly looking. Now we will speak about freely algebra. Of course, if you want to investigate uh, Novisky conjecture toward uh, Lie algebra, we are uh, in a, oh, we, it, it is a big deal because of course it, it should have a, an infinite set of generators. And uh, in order to attack this problem, we have to fix a basis. We choose for this work a whole basis. And I simply described what a whole basis is Nearby. And from now on, L should be the free algebra of rank two, generated by x, y, and the delta is as above, sending y to x and x to zero. Fix a whole basis. Then we now we take a b inside the basis and we call pseudo determinant of type mk of a and b. More, more or less as a determinant. Of course, pseudo determinant of type 0, 1, or 1, 0 are determinants, as I can show here in this example. If you take A as this guy and B as the, the, the commutator, the long term commutator yxx, then delta of A is B, and AB is close to B, a determinant. Okay, we have a factor to. The algebra of constant of L. We, uh, we, we set QK to be the algebra generated by uh, the subdeterminants of the following four, U, A, A, K0, the ones that are constants. We also take an element in the Lie algebra of rank two, and is said to be irreducible if it cannot be written as a product of two elements of the, of the algebra. And we consider the set of irreducible constants. Of course, X is an irreducible constant too. The result is the following. The algebra constant of L is generated by those UK I defined above and the irreducible constant. We also try to conjecture the following. We take uh, a, a whole monomial that is constant under the derivation delta. Then M sh uh, should belong to U1. 
we also can state stronger conjecture supported by some uh, experimental results. And the conjecture is the following. The algebra of constant in the freely algebra of rank two is the algebra generated by X and U1. But this, this is simply a, a conjecture. What about open problems? Okay, as I told you before, among the set of generators, this, uh, these generators are very far from being free. So the research goal in several of the papers I cited above was finding a set of free generators. Vransky and Makarlimanov built up a method in the original Weizenberg problem based on a set theoretical technique of overlappings, but this cannot apply neither in the case of relative free algebras in general, nor in the Lie case. In particular, uh, when we attack the problem of the relatively free uh, uh, algebra of the Grassmann algebra, we noticed uh, the Dransky and Karlimanov uh, method uh, could be applied only for a relatively free uh, for uh, verbally prime algebras. So uh, this is. Uh, an obstruction, uh, topological obstruction of, uh, of the general result or the general method for finding this uh, algebra of constant. And the second one, another direction, uh, which can be found in all in uh, several of the papers cited above, is finding, if it is the case, the rational, the rational form of the Hilbert series or the algebra of constant of. Uh, of course, we chosen chosen out. Of course, we have a question too. Is it true that the Hilbert series of the algebra constant of an algebra is rational? Another contribution by Drensky is with the joint. It is a joint result with Damakosh. Is this is the case if the derivation is a Weizenbach one? So I'm finished and I thank you once again for this opportunity. Thank you so much for your presentation. And uh, I want to ask for questions, remarks, notes, and else. Please, we have time. Butcher, you have a, a small incorrectness in my theorem in, about the generalized Novitsky conjecture. You state that the polynomials F are, they are non constant linear. And they're not linear, they, they can be any. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, 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 maybe. Yeah, 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 of course, of course. They are, also, they are any. Uh, what you're stating in this form, this is uh, a trivial consequence model some classical commutative algebra from the theorem. Like Broda. Of so in my paper, I had a little bit more. I had the Grubner basis. Ah, I would like also to to to, to remark one uh, one more thing. Thank you, Vesely, for for your um, for your comment. I would uh, I would like to to say one thing more. Uh, the problem, uh, the, the fact that uh, these generators are uniformly looking, may give a new look to this theory maybe trying to, to see if the language generated by this algebra is uh, a regular one. Uh, putting uh, this theory inside the general theory of uh, hierarchy, of uh, Chomsky hierarchy of the language. And uh, Veselin gave me this opportunity because he, he mentioned the Grabner basis. This is more or less equivalent to show that the Grobner bases are not finite, but uniformly looking. I mean, you have some finite set of uh, recognizing uh, example of uh, polynomials so that these generators are uh, in these classes. So this should be a, a nice remark in order to, to give more importance to this uh, to this um, to this object of research. 
thank you, Vaseline, for uh, again for the comment. Thank you for, thank you for the nice talk. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Okay. Um, other question remarks? Still time for this one? I saw you see, here, many I... years ago, Ed Forman, who is here, claimed that a nice talk or a nice paper is a paper where you cite me or the speaker. So you had a very, very nice talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so uh, I would like to say first, welcome to our afternoon session. And uh, our first lecture is Alexei Kanel Belov. So the floor is yours. Please welcome. Uh, first of all, say I am very happy to to be here. Um, unfortunately, just online, because uh, of course it would be much better if I have possibility to come online and then I can enjoy conference more. But still, I am still happy to be on the conference, and uh, I am very happy to congratulate. Vesilin Drensky, wonderful first mathematic and the second organizer of mathematics. And many other mathematicians' life as based on his effort. So I want to uh, uh, mention also this. So he is a great, uh, great man and great mathematician, and I am happy to be here. If you, the subject which I am coming is is, is related to uh, to so called uh, uh, to PI theory, but it's not PI theory. It's uh, it's uh, this is related to so to Lvov Kaplansky conjecture. It's about evaluation of multilinear polynomial on different algebra. Uh, Lvov Kaplansky conjecture deal with uh, evaluation of multilinear polynomial on matrix algebra in space. If you consider multilinear polynomial P, then its image is either zero, basic field K, traceless matrix, or whole matrix algebra. It was settled for n equal to and k being quadratically closed or real closed. For this result, for, uh, for larger, there are some partial result, uh, result. And we have some, uh, uh, some review paper. Uh, equations of multilinear polynomials on algebras, methods and problems and involve Kaplansky conjecture. All, all this result was obtained together with uh, and, uh, topological dynamics. Uh, uh, there are other many works of this area, uh, in particular by Mate uh, Berzard, Vitas, it was Kulamin and many other Italian mathematicians, many some speakers begin to work in this area, and I am very happy to do this. Of course, the list of references in the is not complete, but uh, we have some review paper, and uh, there are some much bigger reference the, 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 the uh, We can consider uh, for some arbitrarily simple finite dim dimension. Before coming to opinions, let me start uh, uh, from some ideas I want to point out about uh, matrix case, because it's uh, somehow where we consider uh, it looks strange. You have just two by two matrices. Nothing can be complicated with this algebra. However, Lvov Kaplansky conjecture for this algebra, all through it was so uh, it was solved. Uh, we had a lot of effort and a lot of pain before we achieved solution of Lvov Kaplansky conjecture for complex case, for real cases also 
solved. It's also solved for quadratic field, but still uh, not everything, not for arbitrary field. So it looks strange. Just two by two matrix. How it can be complicated questions can be related with two by two matrices. However, in the spirit uh, for arbitrary, no, we can so, over finite field case. Uh, there are some uh, uh, if. Uh, if, if I want to mention if ground field is finite, the, the, the image of polynomial with ca, constant theorem zero can be any uh, invariant con under conjugation, anything. Polanski conjecture is true for n equal to us, I said, and uh, for a quadratic closed field. Now let's uh, let's remark make some easy but useful remarks. Uh, uh, I want to say uh, I want to uh, to to say the. Uh, uh, I want to say that if you consider a ground field to be uh, to be uh, be not algebraically clo uh, closed, uh, closed, then uh, it's not uh, uh, it's not so easy. Now let's uh, let's let's mention about parallel topic in group theory. We can consider words on groups, and these words in groups, it's so-called uh, word maps. These word maps was extensively studied by, by uh, Shalev, Nikolai Vavilov, and some other. And, uh, and there are a lot of very deep problems. For example, word map on simple group group is the risky dance. It's well known. Consider matrices over uh, two by two matrices over complex uh, field. Let's factor it by its center. You have uh, group, uh, Lie group S SL2 factor by center. Simple Lie group. Consider what map. Is it true, for example, that uh, image of this map um, is everything? It's known that it is dense. For example, the question, can you reach unipotent elements? Nobody knows. Consider, consider simple Lie group. Take, uh, take two by two, ma two by two invertible matrix and factor it by its center. What show and consider word maps on it in characteristic zero. Nobody knows and it's important conjecture, who is, uh, who is very interested, Shalev is promoting this conjecture, that anything, that this map is not just dense, but this map is on to. I want to say about, there are some uh, stuff. Kaplansky conjecture, uh, about let's mention for Kaplansky conjecture. If polynomial is just commutator, that its image consists of tra all traceless ma matrix by the theorem of Albert and, uh, and Mackenhope. And in a, in a, uh, in in general, when it's degree less than four, that for arbitrary n, we know that every element of reduced trace is the sum of it at most two commutators. So I want to say uh, it was some sets of papers of Shalev about wiring problem. So um, it's somehow some analogy. A polynomial uh, P 
is called multilinear of degree m if it has degree one in one in each variables. For example, thus a polynomial is multilinear if it is of the form. Where SM is a symmetric group. For example, xy minus yx is a multilinear polynomial. What are important is the example? Famous Capelli polynomial of degree 2 n, or standard stuff polynomial of degree k. It means, it means that uh, uh, you, all, it's famous standard polynomial in its well-known Amitsur uh, theorem, the Levitsky theorem saying that uh, the n by n algebra of n times n algebra satisfies S to n. About Capelli polynomial cn square vanishes when specializes to set which don't form NFL, but vanish on the matrix algebra. First of all, in the Lvov Kaplansky question, looks rather easy. It's not big deal to see that the linear span generated by values of polynomials is just these four options. However, it is not so so easy. Also, it can be easy to see that if p is a then uh, this is one issue. Lvov, Lvov, now let's go. Uh, one of the formulation is does that in, imply that the image of uh, multilinear polynomial is a vector space? Uh, is uh, when it uh, the, the another question consider polynomial image of of multilinear polynomial is it true that every element of uh, of our uh, vector space generated by image can be sum of just one image this uh, this context is interesting because one can do formulate it, generalize two values of polynomial. And this looks uh, funny. Uh, funny. A polynomial is called central if it takes only, uh, on only scalar values, at least one of which is non-zero. The first examples are due to Formanik and Rasmussen. Uh, also, it was Schmelkin and Latushev examples of them of a finite field before that. But this worked only on finite field. A polynomial P is called n central if P power n is um, is central. Also, although, although P is not central, for example, x commutator x one x two is two central for two by two matrices. Uh, uh, so, uh, e e image polynomial can be equal zero, k, traceless matrix, or every C. For example, any polynomial identity has image zero. Any multilinear central polynomial has image scalar matrices and, the, and nothing else. The image of commutator is all traceless matrix. And if polynomial is just X, then image of it is whole matrices. This, see, one can investigate also semi-homogeneous polynomials of weighted degree D. Such uh, for, if for each monomial H of P, token ZJ, the degree of XJ, which we have the same sum. Di, Vi, a semi homogeneous polynomials with weights one, one, one is called homogeneous of degree G. 
multilinear polynomials means degree of each variable is just one. Now let's come to the case n equal to. The image of semi-homogeneous polynomial evaluated on the algebra to two by two matrix of a quadratically closed field is either zero, k, the set of all non-nilpotent matrices having trace zero, SL2 of k, trace zero matrix, and a dense subset of M2 of k with respect to the risky topology. And this is also possible. And we also give example to show how P can have these images. In the case n equal three, we have uh, this uh, the element is called n scalar if it is not in the center, but n power is in the center. The image of any semi-homogeneous polynomial no, evaluated on central simple algebra of degree three is the risky dense subset of one of the following. No zero, then it coincides the set of scalar matrices in the matrix of trace zero of everything. It is the set of all three scalar elements and or the set of scalars plus three scalar elements. We cannot, we suppose that the three scalar or it's um, uh, when e f is multilinear, it's not known whether the last two cases are non empty. How examples can be found on graded n scalar multilinear polynomials of arbitrary degree n? Uh, now, now I want to say, uh, uh, I, I want. Uh, Let's consider now. Let's uh, let's consider agent values when n equal to. Uh, we, we take the consider polynomial H trace p square divided by trace square p cube. This function takes values of the center f, but it is homogeneous in degree of the agent values. So. It yields of the polynomial on the rational of agent values. When non-constant of Z is dense, then it's P is dense subset of A. When H is constant, then we solve an equation and get another possibility, take into account that P can uh, not be three centers since N is three. No, there are some lemmas about this situation. Now, now, now I want to say, maybe, let me, let me, let me, now, okay. Now I want to now I want to now I want to say uh, 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 now I want to uh, now I want to turn uh, turn uh, turn around to the evaluations of polynomials to on the Actonian algebra. We have following theory. Everything can be sorry, Shadja. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, uh, all of this problematic can be transferred to the uh, to the non-associative case. For for example, and most one of the most interesting case is Actonian algebra. There is a theorem: if P is multilinear polynomial evaluated Actonian algebra, then image of this is is is, is zero or I equal uh, uh, or real numbers, space of scalar actinions, or, um, 
or is the space of pure octonions. In fact, it's the same situation as as uh, as uh, uh, more or less the situation is pretty looks like this. This is um, uh, just a second. We, we also classify possible images of semi-homogeneous polynomials. Uh, if P is semi-homogeneous non-commutative non-associative polynomial of weighted degree D, evaluated on the octonian algebra, then image of P is either zero, A, positive A, negative A, or V, or set of all the few octonians. This is the situation with real case. Quite recently, together with Louis, we got a, a complex case evaluation. Let me show the complex case situation. If, 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 if I, P is multilinear polynomial evaluated on the octonian algebra, then image of P is either zero or centra or space of pure octonions or everything. So it's quite similar to Lvov Kaplansky conjecture for two by two matrices, but um, it is for octonium. If P is semi-homogeneous, then it is either dense or zero or center similar. No. Well, let's remind the definition of, 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 uh, of, uh, of octonian algebra. Octonian algebra is eight-dimensional algebra with following basis. It is... Now let's go to some lemma and some discussion. Let P be a multilinear polynomial. If AI are basic octonions, then polynomial of it is proportional to some basic octonions and some sca scalar. No, sometimes it can be equal to zero. This is the one thing. Another, another lemma is says that for any multilinear polynomial, its image is self-similar cone uh, who preserved by any automorphism of uh, octonian algebra. And, and, and another, another fact is for any three unit pairs pi wise perpendicular pure octonions, the, the, the there exists unique automorphism such that uh, f at i is uh, i, f at j is g, and f at l, uh, i is l. Element of A plus U has this orbit. Uh, the, uh, now I want to have some examples. No, of course, commutator is pure-valued polynomials. Its image is V. A square of pure octonion is a scalar. Then a linearization of it uh, has on, uh, evaluated on pure elements take only scalar uh, values. Therefore, poly uh, these polynomials evaluated on Q is multilinear central polynomial, quite similar to the situation of two-by-two two matrices. Multilinear polynomial can be polynomial identity. You, image of polynomial uh, P of X is, is set of all octonions. So in fact, everything can be possible. Uh, now let's come to the real case. Consider square of commutator. It's central and takes only non-positive uh, values. Yeah, and its image is a uh, uh, it's the set of uh, negative uh, real uh, numbers of the center. And its minus, of course, it provides positive. It's just example uh, for real case. Now let's come to another polynomial. P of X, Y is a square of commutator plus commutator of square. It's sum of two polynomials. 
и мучов за фёст из негатив пилс, и second one has и муви. И ци муч из из трейслес. Зас и мучов пи за set of actonions with non-positive real path. And of course minus p is the set of actonium with non-negative real part. The polynomial square of commutator has a property that uh, g of a b is zero when a is scalar, but g can take a non-zero value when ever a is non-scalar. Thus, g of x1, x2 takes all values except constants. It's just some zoo. Multiple algebra, it looks related with Lie algebra the same way as the alternative algebra related to associative algebra. We consider multiple algebra. And there are uh, special simple uh, multiple algebra, some exceptional. Of course, every Lie algebra is a multiple algebra, but there is finitely dimensional one of algebraic closed field in uh, special algebra, which is called multiple algebra. And about this specific matrix multiple algebra, finitely dimensional of algebraically closed field, uh, if you provide uh, uh, sorry, it's uh, and if you have arbitrary polynomial in uh, M anti commutative variables, then its evaluation uh, on V can be either zero or everything. P can be polynomial identity of non V. Now I want to say about Jordan algebra. Jordan algebra is. Is, is algebra is non-commutative, non-associative algebra, which is commutative and with journal identity. There is a n-dimensional Jordan algebra. Uh, uh, GN, it has this set and the product is defined. This. G3 is a set of self-adjoint two by two real matrices with a standard Jordan product. It has this by G4 is a self-adjoint two by two complex matrix. G6 is a quarter two by two quaternionic matrix. It's a octonionic matrix. So uh, this, uh, this type of journal algebra are pretty important and interesting. And now there is a theory. Let P be any uh, non-associative polynomial. Then its evaluation on GN is either zero or A. The space of pure element of V or GN. So it's somehow some interesting facts about some class of uh, Jordan algebra. There are some, uh, in order to prove it, there are some lemmas like orbit of any, any element, uh, and there are and there are some. Uh, now I want uh, of all any uh, a plus v is a set of all elements a plus. Uh, let's uh, now I want to show there are some examples. Associator, we yes. The associator, uh, one can construct the example of central polynomial as well. If P is associator, then uh, Jordan product of this is central product of it. Also, is there is a way to construct polynomial identity. This is, uh, there are some exa examples, and uh, our results on the with Louis Rowan and uh, Sergey Malev, uh, we are preparing the paper about, uh, about Kelly, uh, about 
about octonion, octonion algebras. And let me also mention that even the proof of lvov kaplansky conjecture in two-by-two two matrix has some deep side. It is using Delin trick. We discussed it in the our paper in, in, in the proceedings of American Mathematical Society. And the most interesting part of proof to prove that any unipotent matrix uh, can be achieved. In order to do this, we use idea, two ideas. First of all, I mean, sure theorem about zero divisors absence in the generic matrix algebra. And another fact, classification of invariance. I mean that Prochesi Rasmuslov theorem from one set and do, uh, Donkin theorem about invariance for positive characteristics. So all of these two stuff works uh, together. But, but, and, and same technique can be transferred to for complex case to octonian algebra. And the, the paper is in progress. And uh, I think uh, we, we, we make a paper more or less soon. And thank you for inviting me. Thank you. <laughs> much for the very interesting and inspiring uh, talk. So now it's time for questions, remarks, uh, discussion, please. Uh, I have a, que a question. Mm -hmm. Hello, actually it's a comment. Uh, uh, the, alg the algebra JEM, you mentioned before, the Jordan algebra. Can yeah. you back there, please? Sure. Yes. It seems to me that they are the Jordan algebras of uh, bilinear, bilinear forms. Yes, yes, you are right. You are right. You are right. Ah, okay. So they are simple, right? Central simple. Yes, yeah. But not all central simple Jordan algebra has this property. There are okay. a lot of Jordan algebra which we cannot handle. Okay. It seems to me that uh, a lot of cases you have considered, uh, you have a multiplicative base of unitary algebras. It seems that uh, it's possible to, to, to have an, a more general approach to simple algebras with this property, maybe. Maybe. And if you will be uh, successful in this approach, uh, we would be happy. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you for the talk. Uh, so it's, uh, anyway, it's uh, some other stuff, which is a depth. I think it's a beginning. By the way, we don't know how to handle this non-homogeneous polynomial over two-by-two two matrices in characteristic zero over C. Non-homogeneous, what can be happy? Yeah. Value evaluations of non homogeneous in complex value uh, two by two matrix, but not homogeneous. We don't know. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there uh, any questions? Seems no, so let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so, welcome back. Our next talk will be given uh, by Martin Kazabu. Martin uh, is a Bulgarian and he's uh, very, very welcome to be again in Sofia. So, uh, you can feel the atmosphere here. Uh, because here is look like uh, a real uh, in-person conference. So the talk will be given uh, just on the board. And uh, I would like to present uh, uh, Martin, because, uh, not because uh, he's not well known. Uh, you, uh, you know him from his work, 
but uh, of course uh, we, I can say a lot for him, but uh, I will uh, say only the things that are connected with the Institute and with the uh, Vesel Indrensky. Uh, Martin finished his uh, uh, master thesis uh, under the supervision of uh, uh, the, the Vesel Indrensky. He is one of his uh, students and uh, Martin was uh, also awarded uh, the Mathematics Prize of the Institute of Mathematics and Informatics uh, for 2014. And uh, okay, let's let me stop here. So I'm giving the, the floor to Martin. So please, Martin, welcome. Uh, thank you very much for the warm introduction. Like that was really bit unexpected. Uh, so this is a joint work with uh, Pierre Manuel Capras, and uh, it's very dedicated to Mr. Gensky. I really worked a lot from him like 25 years ago when I was doing my master thesis. And there are so many tools and tricks which I learned from him, which I'm using like almost every day, and I'm really grateful for like everything he taught me. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is some small example of like a group which I find very interesting and it has like a little bit of like surprising properties and in some sense it's like one of the easiest examples of the group suite things like that. Um, okay so first like this is not really in theory even though like it's related to a bunch of things and polynomial algebras but mostly I'm doing group theory so this is like slightly off so here is a uh, very short summary of what I'm going to talk about. Like I'm very much to talk about like three small things or uh, like three sections. One is to really define like this group, which like more or less like I found by accident about a year ago. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of these properties and why I find it interesting. And maybe at the end I can just comment about some extra questions or where things like can go. So, okay. so the first thing is uh, 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 so this group is like the, the, there are many ways to define it like the way I define it uh, is like this kind of like very symmetric generators like uh, so like that group is also the polynomial algebra uh, which is like uh, three generators, so uh, which are like some kind of like very easy automorphisms, which like fix like most variables and like change only one of them, and there is some kind of like a bunch of factor symmetry. But this is like not necessary. Like almost everything can be done by many similar examples. Like and we really don't need a lot of stuff. However, one of the things which I need, which is probably going to be very surprising for most of you, is I'm more or less forced to work in positive characteristic and I'm forced to work over a finite field. Uh, things like that can be done in upper characteristic zero, but they're going to be a little bit more annoying and I really don't want to try to do anything like that. Uh, and then there are a bunch of like minor technical conditions, like I really need my crank to be more than seven. And at some point, I might mention why I need this thing. But you need some kind of like small things, and like as people know, like when you deal with computations of this type, when you work over very small times, everything becomes like very crazy, and like you really don't know. Um, okay, so as I said, what, what are my generators? And like they act as like automorphisms of the polynomial algebra on three variables, and essentially. The only thing they do is they take one generator and that's where the other is, and takes one. Uh, and like I'm just doing some kind of simple permutation because this makes things a little bit easier. And so, uh, what I want to say is that, like, what we proved with Pierre Manuel is that this group uh, has like two very interesting properties. And like, depending on where you're coming from, like, you might find like some of them surprising, or the combination of both of them surprising, or anything. So the first property is uh, something coming from the representation theory. If the group has something which is known as Krishna property P, and I'm going to mention something on the next slides about it and like why it's related. Uh, and the next one, which is a little bit more natural, a little bit easier to understand is this group has like a lot of like nice finite functions and some of these functions are very easy to describe 
In particular, it maps onto very big alternating groups, like you get family of alternating groups, uh, which means that like these alternating groups come with like an interesting set of three generators, which like has a bunch of property, which are related to uh, property of the group. So one comment was that about like 20 or 25 years ago, people more or less believed that like such groups cannot exist uh, because they try to find like generators of alternating groups with like some properties which should be common from property and like they were not successful. Uh, this changed at some point, and but still there was not like a very clear example of a group which is like this. So and like real real breakthrough was three or four years ago when uh, Mario, Piotr, and Tucker they proved that, uh, that the alpha group of the free group uh, has property E. Uh, and so uh, this is like a group which has a very similar properties uh, because it's very well known that you can take, uh, you can use the action of the automorphism group of the group on to generating tuples of final groups. And when you write down what this action is, like essentially becomes like a symmetric or alternating group. In most cases, it's a symmetric. Uh, so, they actually proved like one of the first examples of group with uh, these properties. And okay, I think this example is a little bit simpler. Uh, one of the big differences, which I'm going to mention in a second, is that essentially the proof of property T is much easier. Uh, okay, so that's a very short story. If you haven't seen property T, okay, some of you might have because like that's one of the things I'm doing. And, Almost every time I give a talk, I talk something great for property. Uh, if you haven't seen it, like this is something which is almost impossible to comprehend and to digest in my an hour talk. So I'm not even trying. Um, so the short topic, okay, there are two definitions or two motivations. Uh, it comes from representation theory or like represent, uh, unitary representation theory, to be more precise. Uh, a very short definition is one can consider the set of all unitary representations of a group. Uh, inside this set, there is one very special point, which is like the easiest representation of the group, which is the people representation. And the other thing one can do, which is like actually gets some bit more tricky, one can put like a natural topology on this set of previous group representations. And probably it is saying that the group representation is isolated point, it can be separated for all the others. Uh, of course, like there are so many things inside this definition, which is like almost impossible to unwrap like, if you haven't seen before and or if you haven't created like many examples. Uh, but it's a very short definition, which is like good for putting on the swipe, even though like this is a way to confuse everyone. Another like definition, but like if you want to make it precise, you need to be very careful when you have to start like fixing generating set, like uh, being very careful how to order all, all the quantifiers and so on, which again I'm going to skip because I don't want to take too much time about that. Uh, a group has probability e. if you have a unitary representation, which have a vector, a, a unit vector, which is almost invariant by the generators, which means that like all the generators move to this vector just a little bit. This forces the representation to have a Better, which is invariant by the problem. However, you need to be very careful how to quantify this thing. Like, what do you mean by almost invariant? I like, put some epsilons and so on, and like talk about like, a bunch of invariants and so on. Now, why people care about this kind of stuff? Uh, one reason, uh, which is like one of the first like applications of property in, uh, is that. This can be used to produce graphs with like a very large spectral graph. So if you have a group with property D, if you take any quotient of the group, then you can project the generators of your group onto uh, this quotient. So you're going to have like a bunch of quotients with a fixed generator set. And from there you can build like a bunch of carry graphs. You can try to fix like talk about properties of these carry graphs, how to connect they are, how quickly. Um, grow and so on, like 
you get like a very easy result of which like you will have them without like things behave reasonably nicely for the graph question. And like this observation was done by who is like in the mid-70s, uh, where he actually produced the first example of graphs with all these properties coming from like previous results of graphs and so on. Okay, so now let me talk a little bit about like how one can prove probability for this group. Uh, and uh, the group goes back to uh, using some ideas which I uh, started by Timoyak uh, and uh, Dubrian Chukevich. So I think this was like early 2000s, maybe 2002 or 2003. And uh, they developed some kind of tools which I also want to prove probability for when the group is generated by a bunch of final groups, providing that like these final groups are situ uh, situated in a very nice way. And it's not very easy how to, um, to describe what this condition is, but in some sense, like this condition is like does the groups almost compute. But almost is a very imprecise word there, right? They can generate a bunch of things we can very far from commuting, but like the motivation is something like uh, commuting between uh, and simple. And the key idea behind their argument is that if you have a representation of the big group and if you have a bunch of finite subgroups inside, then you can look at the fixed subspaces of each of these groups. And now if you have an almost invariant vector, this, uh, this gives you a vector which needs to be very close to each of these subspaces. And the second thing is like this almost commuting property is saying that like all these spaces are almost perpendicular to each other. And then it's a very simple geometric description uh, that like if you have a bunch of subspaces which are almost perpendicular, if you have a vector which is close to all of them, it has to be close to their intersection. But in this case, the intersection of uh, all these subspaces, these are exactly vectors which are invariant by each of these subgroups which generate your big group. So this is going to be like the uh, invariant vectors in the representation. Uh, so when they did this thing, this was like more or less like some kind of like very imprecise argument. Okay, they made some kind of precise estimates, but like nobody tried to improve the constants and make them anything. Uh, small and reasonable, and people believe that like this is like completely impractical or like any reasonable groups. Uh, however, about like uh, ten years later, uh, Michel Ashwood and Andrei uh, Parkin and Lepian, they actually took this uh, idea and they tried to improve it a lot, and uh, they tried to optimize like what exactly these conditions for like. Almost perpendicular means uh, of almost, uh, almost perpendicular subspaces, almost committing subgroups, and like actually proved a several very useful results, uh, which mostly apply to the case where every two subgroups generate something which is important. And uh, this is one of the reasons why I pick uh, these generators. Uh, so, in this example, we have a group which is generated by three elements of order P. Uh, and so uh, this was like, as put on slide, this was discovered, uh, this was like observed by a bunch of people earlier this year. And uh, not only uh, the generators of our order P, but it's very easy to compute so what is the group generated by any of them. Because you start computing commutators, and like once you start computing enough commutators, like things start to become pretty Because like, if you have uh, automorphism of the polynomials, which like sends x to x plus y, and another one which sends y to y plus z, when you commute them, the commutator is going to be to send x to x plus z, and this is going to see that it has. Okay, here the situation is a little bit more difficult, uh, different, like there are some squares which make things slightly more complicated, so we have to uh, compute x twice or three times, but this is not going to make things like any different. And as a result, the group generated by any two of them is impossible to work with. And once you have this thing, why like you can just take everything, put it in this kind of big machinery, and see what happens. And like at the end, what you need to do is you need to verify that 
some inequalities as uh, satisfied. And this inequality depends a little bit on the prime thing because, like, things related to uh, almost perfect clarity, the prime thing gets involved. But it's not that bad. Like, at the end, like, you only need like the prime to be more than seven for this thing to work. Uh, I actually believe that probably this thing works for p equals seven, but I haven't actually sit down to verify all the computations. Okay, so let me just make a small assignment, which is like not related to what I'm talking about, uh, but like this is just to show what is the difference between this example and the example I mentioned before about probability for L uh, So, therefore, for that L uh, has probability uh, goes back uh, in a very different direction. So, uh, this has been like an open question for like 20 or 30 years. Uh, but one thing which like get it moving a little bit was a uh, result by Osama, which says that you can prove probability by some kind of like direct computations in the group algebra of uh, In Informally, probability is related to some kind of like spectral um, <coughs> or like some positive definiteness of certain operators. And what Osama proved is that every group with probability you can observe it by showing that certain elements in the group algebra can be written as sum of squares or something close enough to sum of squares, which is something which seems to be easy to check. The problem is for almost all groups, like the expressions get like so big that like you cannot really divide them. Uh, a little bit later, like Many people starting from the storm and others, like they use like a bunch of computers and this criteria to prove that like many groups like do have probability. Uh, most of these examples were like previously known groups with probability, but what uh, Marek, uh, Piotr, and Mike Zang managed to do is they did for like out of five and created generalized group to out of ten, and they show that like this criteria is satisfied. Uh, one thing which uh, makes me unhappy with this proof, and like not only there was people who are like not big fans of this kind of proof, is that this is entirely computer generated proof. You have like one element which we, you need to write as a sum of squares. Okay, like you just write down, like to the computer to search them, you get an expression which I think involves like a couple of like maybe tens of thousands of terms. And like there is like a lot of things you need to be careful when you're doing like computations of this order. So you need to make sure that like all your organic errors are not going to get like too bad and like they're not going you're not going to get this information inside there. Uh, so the way to do it if you are if you really want to verify that your computation is correct is like do everything with interval arithmetic and so on. So essentially most of the proof is a computer code which I need to verify. Like the idea is very simple, but unless like this code works and gives you the correct result, like you don't know what's going to uh, So that's uh, like the difference between these two approaches. Like one is like something which is like at least for me you can verify by hand very easy. The other one definitely gives you better tone, definitely gives you like stronger results. About uh, uses like relatively heavy computer machinery, and at least for me, I'm not a big fan of this kind of groups. Okay, so let's move for uh, to the last part. And the last part, depending on where you're coming from, is uh, maybe relatively easy or like relatively expected. At least for me, this was something which is like, okay, I got this group, I just have to like verify the things. And this group is supposed to uh, have quite a lot of big portions, and that's not really surprising. However, if you go to prove it, like this becomes a little bit technical, and there are a couple of things which try to have to be very So, okay. so the first thing is uh, to realize like how to naturally produce actions of this group on finite sets. Because the way the group is defined is automorphism of some. Big uh, polynomial algebra, and like you have no idea where to start. But the natural thing to start is to say, okay, if a group acts on the sum algebra, it must act on the spectrum, and the spectrum is like nearly a bunch of points over the finite field. 
or it means by function or if you want, if you don't want to deal with infinite fields, so like you can fix like a big fine field of characteristic P, and then act on tables of points, which is like how you're going to specialize X, Y, and Z. And the action is more or less as before. So you have like uh, the triple X, Y, Z goes to X plus Y square and Y and Z are fixed and all that. Okay, so you have a bunch of actions, and now you expect that like these actions are going to give you uh, something like automatic group. Okay, so your initial intuition is like, okay, this action must be transitive, but must be higher transitive, and therefore there is nothing else which it can be, so it should be the automatic group or the symmetric group. It cannot be the symmetric group because the group is uh, generated by arguments of all order, so it does not have any quotient of size two. However, the things are a little bit weird because, okay, first the action is not transitive, second, uh, moving that like it's hard to see, gets a little bit complicated, and so on. Okay, so uh, what makes it like complicated is that even on all this, uh, the action is not as the full out of this group. And one reason the action is not the full out of this group is that there is an extra action which commutes with the action type. And the first action, which is like very easy to see, is that if I have a group, a group of like polynomial automorphisms, uh, then it always going to compute with uh, the field automorphisms. So if I take the Fubinius and the fight, then like it doesn't matter whether I fight before or after. So there is some kind of obstruction coming from the Fubinius which I need to preserve, but like that's not really that uh, very difficult. The other thing which I actually found a little bit surprising and took me a lot of like, computations to verify that this is this happening. Is that there is an extra action by a cyclic group of all the seven and uh, which commits with like nine. And the action is not really that difficult, like there are not that many actions that could support the seven, like you just need to pick the seven to the trinity and like you have to figure out like how to multiply each of the variables by which power which, uh, the trinity. And like in this case, you see that like the powers which work are like four to and powers. And this might seem like very mysterious or surprising, but after you look at this thing, you realize that there should be a very good explanation why we have something like that. And the only possible explanation is that there is an extra grading of the polynomial algebra on three variables, which is preserved by my action. And this grading has to be by uh, sim of 7z. And you can look at it like what it should be. So you have one transformation which is x goes to x, square, x plus y squared. This forces the degree of x to be twice the degree of one, if you want like these things to be commissioned. So eventually, this forces the degree of x to be four, the degree of y to be two, and the degree of z to be one. And actually, seven arises from this picture as like two cubed minus one. So you're forced to have uh, z of seven z because like this thing needs to move around and you all see the degree of z to be twice the degree of x. Okay, so now, okay, we have uh, we know some obstructions which what prevents us from having a group which is uh, to be the full alternating group or the full symmetric group. So now the only thing we need to show is that like that's essentially the everything we need. And now things are getting a little bit uh, complicated uh, because you need to do a very annoying induction. Okay, the induction is not annoying. The induction is very natural in some sense, but like it's a little bit tricky to write. And uh, this is the goal of this induction is to show that like the group is reasonably close to the full group of ten automorphisms of this group uh, of this polynomial. Okay. First, I don't know whether the group of all 10 automorphisms of uh, like the polynomial algebra is finally generated. Uh, okay, I'm a little bit scared to make statements like this uh, in, very, in positive characteristics. In fact, get a little bit annoying, and I definitely cannot really get everything. 
but uh, what we're able to get is to get like a bunch of uh, uh, like elements in the group which are very close to what we need. So one is that we have we can do we can use these generators to construct elements which are not only x goes to x plus y squared but x goes to some other power of y. And now, okay, since you have this gradient which needs to be preserved by this forcing this power of y to be multiple of seven plus one or something like that, uh, but you need to generate all these elements. Uh, and like, unfortunately, this is not enough. You need to do a little bit more. You need to also construct the elements where like you are by uh, power of y times some, some z, and then you have something. And uh, this more really tells you that, like, once you have that many elements inside your group, you can do a lot of stuff. Because essentially, what this allows you to do is, like, you can take x and you can add to x any polynomial of y. But, like, if y is a field generator, then, like, you can pick, like, this polynomial of y to be anything you want, and, like, it's going to remove the value of x, and, like, you're going to make it zero. Okay, so from here, what you can do is uh, you can show that, like, if you take the, uh, like one of the big orbits, and there are a bunch of technical things which one needs to do in order to, like, describe all the orbits, like, classify them, figure out, like, what is the precise meaning of the big orbit. Uh, in this case, like, one can expect that, like, the big orbit means that, like, x, y, and z generate. Uh, uh, the, the field, uh, field, but that's not enough. Like, you actually need something like the seven power of these elements to generate it because, like, if you have this gradient by small seven, and like, to expect it and stuff like that. But uh, from there, you can very easily see that, like, the group becomes transitive on when this condition is satisfied because, like, you start with tuple and, and like, you start to apply transformations of this form with three tuple polynomials. And you're going to uh, add a bunch of zeros to uh, of some of the elements, and eventually you're going to make the two of the elements equal to zero, and this essentially twice transitivity. Now, uh, if you want to do a little bit more, you want to prove that like everything is not transitive, but like two transitive or three transitive, and so on. And you have to take this argument and repeat it, and like be very careful to say, okay, like. I can do this thing on my second point without undoing what I have done on my first point in my canonical form. But eventually, you're going to get that uh, the action is as transitive as you want. Uh, in practice, you never need more than like seven transitive because like that's enough. Uh, again, this is probably going to add some restrictions on Q. Uh, I think for this argument to work, you probably need Q to be something like more than 50, uh, but this is not really a problem why you can always expand like numbers. Okay, so what you get out of here, which is probably my last slide, uh, is that when you look at like the last orbit, uh, this, this large orbit, since you have a very transitive fraction, you can pull the very deep result, which comes from the classification of the and simple curves, uh, but it has been around, like, not as a proof, but as a popular statement for a very long time. Is that if you have a permutation group which acts like six or seven transitive, it has to be either the full symmetric group or the full alternate group. There is nothing in between which is highly transitive. Uh, okay, if you are only five transitive, there are a couple of exceptions, like you get magic groups, like if you go quite or there are like many exceptions, you get like general linear groups and stuff like that. So at the end, what you get is that this gives you a very nice final quotient of the group, and you can actually estimate what is the, the size of the group. Like you have approximately Q plus points, which is like P to the 3D, and then you have to quotient by the action uh, by the group, which I like, commute with your group, so that like you have to make sure that like you identify the orbits. So one action is by the convenience, which is a group of order uh, E, which is the exponent of the of the time field. The other one is related to uh, whether you have like seven groups of unity in your field or not, but it's not a big factor, it's something like seven. 
And of course, this is only approximately because I also need to add a bunch of extra conditions that I'm in this very large orbit and I'm not in one of the smaller ones. It's not very difficult to write probably very precise to the size of the uh, orbit, but it's going to have some inclusion exclusion, which is like the same way you count like that would be useful for polynomials in the other way over FP. But at the end, like you get a bunch of numbers which like go like this. Okay, so a couple of comments I want to mention at the end, and uh, like they're like just a quick comments, and I'm not here going to go very deep into those or whatever. Uh, so I started with an example which, at least for me, is like as symmetric as possible. So I said, like, all my two generators should be essentially the same, and like I was adding quite square to a compare control the other to the other. You don't really need the two generators to be the same. You don't really need like to have like key variables. You can do it the same construction with like polynomials and the key variables or anything like that. There is quite a bit of flexibility. The only thing you of course not allowed to do is you're not allowed to take all the exponents to be equal to one because you have to put something non-linear in this picture, otherwise you're going to get a certain group of like uh, SLM or something like that, which is going to be significantly small. Another thing you can do, and this is a little bit technical, is you can somehow do this thing simultaneously for low prime speed. Uh, it's not clear how to do it when using what I described here, but like there are a couple of things uh, if you can do to avoid that. Uh, and so this gives you, in some sense, some subgroups of like automorphisms of not exactly of zero joint x, y, and z, but you also have to invert some number like one over 30 or something like that, you know, to make sure things are going to work. But most of the other arguments are going to be the same, like you're still going to have like many quotients which corresponds to automating groups coming from like action on finite fields, and you can essentially use any finite field of characteristic, which is not 2, 3, 5, or 7, uh, and stuff like that. Okay, so the last slide is like maybe I want to thank the singing for like everything like he taught me, and I want to wish him like happy university and like a lot of nice things to happen in the future. And thank you very much for the Thank you, thank you Martin. It's uh, time for questions, remarks, or a discussion. So please, the floor is yours. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, Martina, I, I'm sure you explained that then I couldn't, uh, I couldn't, maybe I didn't understand. Um, why ideologically there is a conflict between property T and, and having alternating quotients? Oh. Okay, so this goes back to Okay, it's not really a notable problem. So, uh, property T implies that like, you can find generating sets of the, uh, of the group such that when you deal the corresponding carry graph, you're going to have a uniform spectral graph which is not going to depend on that. And since the, uh, the carry graph is, going to be, is very big, like, this is something which is a little bit unexpected. People try to you do this thing with the like obvious generators like a long cycle and transposition or anything like this, and they were unable to make it work. And a lot of people tried to make this thing work for 20 something years, maybe more, and none of them was successful. And people started believing that this thing is impossible. And that's why like, nearly one of the reasons for this kind of problem. But uh, it turns out to be possible. Like I was able to do this thing like 20 years ago or like 50. Of course, this is one of my results which like nobody understands and everybody quotes. Uh, and like recently, like all these proofs are giving you some kind of like easy way to understand why this thing is happening and how to construct such generating sets of automating groups. Okay. Okay, thank you. Any questions?
Okay, if not, please uh, let's thank the Martin again. And let's thank to the speakers of this session again. We have as our next speaker, uh, Lenin Makarlimanov on my stage. Uh, so please go ahead, you are on air. Okay, so with your kind permission, let me start. And what I will talk about is centralizers of rank one in the first wave algebra. <coughs> uh, so, uh, wave algebra is one of the most popular non commutative algebras. But if you don't remember what it is, if it's not what you're doing, I, I'll remind you what it is. So, don't, don't worry about this. And um, here goes short refresher. So you can think about first well algebra is algebra of, uh, yeah, well, purely algebraic, just generated by two elements, delta D and X such that DX minus XD is equal to one. Now, why this algebra is so popular? If characteristic of ground field is zero, then you can think about it as algebra generated by two operators acting, say, on polynomials or, well, if it's arbitrary field, we will talk about polynomials. If you have over complex numbers, you can act on smooth functions, whatever. So on polynomials, one, namely little x, is just multiplication by variable, and d is taking derivative relative to x. So if you take, yeah, then it's easy to check that this relation will be satisfied. So if you first multiply polynomial by x and take derivative, then it's polynomial of x plus x multiplied by derivative applied to polynomial. So if you take this difference and apply it to polynomial p, then it's p. That's why this commutator is indeed one. So you can think about while algebra is differential operators with polynomial coefficients. And because of this commuting relation, since dx is xd plus one, you always can rewrite them as ordinary polynomials where x is first in monomials and d is second in monomials. What addition then will be just ordinary addition of polynomials, but multiplication is more complicated it's sometimes called star multiplication, and uh, we don't need actually to know formally for that. It's not very interesting. So, in, in this talk, I'll restrict my attention to complex numbers, and though characteristic zero is as good as whatever. With finite characteristic situation is completely different, while algebra becomes uh, finite dimensional over its center, and um, it has some strange effects. So, <coughs> since it's not commutative algebra, you can take an element, you can consider all elements which commute with it, and so call it centralizer of this element and try to research it. And first person to research it was uh, uh, George Georg, actually, Wallenberg, in the yeah, German mathematician in 1903. Or well, he decided to work with, with this, but he didn't work with while algebra. He worked sort of with abstract differential operators. So you, you, you contain derivative, but coefficients were just abstract differentiable functions. And he mentions that he was, he thinks that he's the first to study, he mentions some famous work by Gaston Flaquet on the theory of differential equations, not linear differential equations. And he uh, claims that Flaquet, and I never saw this paper, so I don't know. Yeah, the paper of Wallenberg I saw, uh, that he researched when two operators of order one. Yeah, and order in this context, it's uh, the order of derivative, how high, uh, so sort of ordinary order of differential operators. <coughs> so 
So the highest power, algebraically speaking, is power relative to d of the operator. Well, for order one, it's indeed quite trivial. And then he repeated it, Wallenberg, and then he gave complete description for two operators, commuting operators, both of order two. Again, it's not too hard. Again, it's quite easy. Next case, which he consider one operator has order one, other operator has arbitrary order. And then he worked with case when one operator has order two and the other is order three. And it's already an interesting case. And he noticed that some so-called Herstrass elliptic function appears on the coefficients. And again, don't worry if you don't remember, I will mention it eventually. So he researched this case <coughs> completely. Then he tried to research case with orders two and five, but uh, he worked through some examples and he understood how it can be done, but that was it. And he didn't develop anything general. Next personality work on it is a Sai Shur, a famous Shur. And uh, he proved the following. He proved that if you take element in A1, which is not a central element, which yeah, doesn't belong just to field of complex numbers, that's the only, that's the center of A1 over complex numbers. And consider all elements which commute with it, <coughs> then it would be commutative subring. So there are some computations here, which again, it's easy. Yeah, it's, it's the same that X commuted with D in power N. It's just derivative with negative sign and similar. So you can play with well algebra. And, yeah. That's interesting that this theorem that centralizer is commutative was proved many times. And let's say Shimshan Amitsur proved it as well. And uh, people were reproving the theorem somehow. They didn't know that it was proved in 1903. Now, Isaiah uh, uh, Shur, to make this short, proved it using uh, the pseudo differential operators, which, of course, <laughs> was not introduced with this name for many, many years. Um, he uh, realized that if you have two commuting operators, say, call them A and B, then you can present B as by fractional powers of A. So that was a brilliant idea to introduce fractional powers of operators. Of course, again, he worked not in um, while algebra where you cannot do this. It's not big enough. But he extended it to algebra with elements like this. So you have summation from k to negative infinity. Again, it's some kind of revolutionary idea to introduce uh, in negative powers of d. Of course, you can think about antiderivatives, but it's algebraically, it won't be profitable. So you, you have to do some, some formal computations in order to be able to work with power series like this. And in this power series under certain conditions, you indeed can take square roots, cubic roots, what not, uh, roots of elements and work with expressions like this. So he showed that if B commutes with A, you can present it as this fractional power series. And then of course, any two fractional power series like this commute with each other. Yeah, of course, uh, 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 proof by Amitsur was much later. It was in the 50s, and it was purely algebraic. You don't have uh, yeah, uh, expressions, complicated expressions like this. What is interesting that, well, I'll, I'll mention later some other author who also didn't know about this theorem and rediscovered it. So first general result of belonging to this pair of British mathematicians, Burnshaw and Chowdhury, and since it's complicated, I will refer to them as B and C. And they published her, their work in 1922. 
Actually, it was a report to the London Society and it was called Computing Ordinary Differential Operators. And they start investigation of this problem, which differential operators compute. And they didn't know about work of Bollenberg. <coughs> so what they wanted to do, they want to completely determine commutative operators, which are not polynomials of one fixed operator. Of course, if you have polynomial of operator and other polynomial of same operator, they certainly commute. So they were inspired by the following pair of operators. It's not hard to show that they commute. And what is interesting, well, they didn't understand it, I think, that these two operators are actually powers of the same operator, which is of more complicated nature. It's a rational function in D. Uh, but, uh, well, it's easy to check that they commute, and it's easy to check that they're not polynomials in operator, because if this operator would exist, it should be of first order, and it's easy to check. So what they discovered and what was then rediscovered many times and was actually sort of a key to researching this problem was that if two operators commute, then they satisfy a polynomial relation. Now, what the fact that two commuting operator satisfy a polynomial relation is not by itself, it can be proved purely algebraically, it's not a deep result. What is interesting though, that you don't know what would be degree of this polynomial in two variables for which we are such that P and Q satisfy this relation. Say if you take <coughs> or say if you take two polynomials and one variable, of course they satisfy a relation like this. And then under certain conditions, you can easily show what would be degree of this polynomial in two variables relative to first one and the second one. But with differential operator situation is different. So that was non-trivial result by B and C that they're of the right degrees. Uh, so uh, if you have operator of order two and operator of order three and they commute, then they satisfy polynomial such that it is of degree three relative to A and degree two relative to B. So what they discovered now, they rediscovered result of Wallenberg that if they commute and they are monic in D, so then you can reduce them to this form where psi is this Weierstrass function that is a function which satisfies the following if you want differential equation, the derivative of this function squared is a cubic polynomial in psi. And that's complete description of pairs like this. Now, um, why Wallenberg, uh, why uh, BNC looked at monic operators and only at monic operators? If you are working with abstract differential operators, then by change of variables, you can make them monic. When you work in while algebra, it's not the case because if you try to do it in while algebra to make corresponding change of variables, you will jump away from while algebra. You will be in a larger algebra. And it's interesting because now traditionally all works, more or less all works are dealing with monic operators even when we talk about while algebra. <coughs> so they wrote a couple more papers and they were yeah, yeah, making rather substantial progress, but they were not able to realize their problem to describe all possible structure of all possible commutators. And that was 
kind of the end of the story for many years. Now, uh, many years later, and I, I, I spoke with George, and it's not clear who was first to introduce notion of rank. So what is the rank of centralizer? You look at elements of centralizer, you're looking at their orders as differential operators. So let me just fix four order for this one. And you're taking greatest common divisor of all orders. And this greatest common divisor is called rank. So it, uh, Wilson introduced it. And also there is a work by Greenfield where he's thought about some results of Kritschewer and sort of recast them and rather abstract algebraic, algebraical geometrical sense. He also introduced something which can be interpreted as rank. Now, rank is not, it's convenient notion to work, but it's not extremely sensible because if you do, if you say take uh, a centralizer of some rank in Weyl algebra and then apply an atomorphism, then rank will change. So it's not stable under atomorphisms. But still, it's convenient. It's convenient tool in order to, to work with it. Uh, it's similar to degrees, say, in polynomials and two variables, which on one hand is convenient tool, uh, degrees. But on the other hand, they're not very sensible because under atomorphisms, they change. So that's rank of centralizer and BNC worked with centralizer of, of rank one because they were concerned with two operators with relatively prime orders. So that was it. Then there was a long gap until the work of Diximier. So Diximier wrote a very influential paper on Weyl algebra uh, and on actually on Weyl algebras and <laughs> he rediscovered again this centralizer theorem. So when we got in Moscow his preprint, it, it contained the proof that centralizer of non-trivial element in Weyl algebra is commutative. And he didn't know about Amitsur's result. And we didn't know about, in Moscow, about Shur's result. And he discovered two elements, well, or actually well, some series of elements, but two elements, one of order six, other of order nine, or you can make an atomorphism, then they will become of order four and six, uh, uh, such that they commute, but centralizer of which is uh, isomorphic to the ring of regular functions on elliptic curve. So that was quite interesting because a, a lot of examples which belong sort of in the spirit of BNC in Weyl algebra were just subrings of polynomial rings and one variable. So rank here is three, right? Because here order is six, here order is nine, greatest common divisor is three. And that was starting point for interesting research. And simultaneously, there, were, there was a big paper by Gelfand and Kirillov about Weyl algebras and fields of fractions of Weyl algebra with some conjecture that all reasonable universal enveloping algebras of algebraic algebras are, if you take fields of fractions, that they will be in this list. So then there was a gap again. And uh, then uh, the school of uh, Sergei Novikov start actively researching this question about centralizers. So first work was by Kritschiver. <coughs> That's kind of a short announcement. And then more or less simultaneously work of Dreamfield. And as he writes in his note, he was listening to Kritschewer's 
report on Gelfand's seminar and start thinking about it. And so that's the paper where he introduced some notion which can be interpreted as this rank thing. So uh, then there are a lot, a lot of works, too many to mention. Again, if you want, it's one of the papers or you can look at my paper, which already appeared on this topic with some list of uh, works primarily, it's not exclusively but primarily, but uh, people from Novikov school who are working on this centralizer business and it's related to partial differential equations to some interesting questions in physics and whatnot. So it's for rank one, there is some theory, not on level of while algebra, but on the level of this sort of abstract differential operators. And for other situations, as far as while algebra is concerned, there is a lot, a lot of different examples. So what was impetus for these examples to present a couple of operators with relatively prime orders, which commute such that centralizers of these operators. And of course, since centralizer is commutative, it's kind of a maximal commutative sub -algebra, subalgebra. So it doesn't matter which of these two operators you will take, centralizers will be the same. Uh, so that these centralizers are isomorphic to the rings of regular functions on curves of high genus. And uh, yeah, there are quite a lot, it's somehow uh, two young men let, yeah, with family names starting with letter M. I think, let me look, I keep forgetting. Uh, I think, yeah, Mironov and Mohov are maybe champions here as far as, as far as examples are concerned. But it's on level of examples with some properties and, and that's quite non-trivial. That's quite non-trivial, say. There is a work of Grunebaum where he researched all elements, oh, 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 pairs of order four and six, and it's quite computationally extensive, so it's not easy. So what now, what, that's kind of a historical remarks, now what I want to talk about and where I was lucky to make some progress, it's about centralizers of rank one in, in Wiley algebra. Uh, so, it's, once again, it's greatest common divisor of uh, orders. And, let me introduce yeah. uh, your voice uh, disappeared. Oh, so can you, can you hear from the okay. title centralizer of type one? Okay. Can you hear me now? Hello? Can you hear me or not? Yes, uh, yes, yes. Okay, yes. okay. So, it was some kind of a temporary aberration. Okay. So we're talking about centralizers. We are not hearing you. Again, not hearing me. Hello? Huh. I don't know what, what to do here. I'm hearing you. So, oh, so you can hear me, yeah? Yes, I, I can you. hear you right now. Mm -hmm. I, so I don't know what's going on. Uh, okay, so uh, we have the centralizers of rank one, but now we're dealing with while algebra. With my algebra. So, what is the technique of yeah, which allows to prove something here? And it was developed by this uh, in this paper of Dixivier. Dixivier, say among other things, described all automorphisms of first by algebra. And uh, by the way, uh, it's the only group of automorphism as far as by algebras are concerned, which is known. If you take uh, Second while algebra, so what it is, it's, it's generated by partial derivatives relative to X and Y and multiplication by X and Y, then automorphism already are not known. Mm -hmm. But for while algebra, which we're looking at, yeah, first while algebra, they're known. So um, what he uh, realized that you, if you work, you can introduce weight degree functions on these algebras so how you're working, you take two, say, integers, and then you uh, take 
monomial and monomial has weight just like with ordinary polynomials. So rho i plus sigma j. And then if you take an element, you take maximum of weights of monomials and say that's your degree. And then you consider leading form of element A, which consists only of monomials of maximal weight with their coefficients. So if you restrict your attention to these leading forms, then they behave as commuting polynomials, provided these weights satisfy certain conditions. For example, if they're both positive, then they certainly, when you, what, what do I mean? That if you multiply two elements of YL algebra, then leading forms are multiplied as commutative polynomials because all difference because of this commuting relation that uh, yeah dx is x d plus one are in smaller degrees and that's the restriction so rho plus sig rho plus sigma should be positive yeah if it's rho plus sigma is zero then still you can introduce leading forms but then they will be multiplied not as commutative polynomials but in more complicated fashion so you can work with leading forms and that's what gives you possibility to sort of prove things about it that's how he say for example described with help of this observation he was able to describe the atomorphism group now another wonderful property if weights satisfy this condition rho plus sigma that if you take and this is shorthand for commutator so this square brackets of a and b it's a b minus b a so the leading form of commutator would be poisson bracket and i remind you what it is of leading forms if poisson bracket of leading forms is not zero so poisson bracket of leading forms it's just you're looking at these leading forms as commutative polynomials and variables d and x and then you consider this contraption so partial by d partial by x minus partial by x partial by d so it's standard Poisson break so if it's not zero that that would be but if of course if it's zero then you have to go yeah you have to go further so that's the main tool working with these leading forms and also uh, there is a picture behind all that so-called newton polygons so it, Newton polygons, just like these polynomials, you are marking on Newton plane integer points with integer coordinates. You are marking points i, j, if monomial, what is how I'm writing here, x and power i, d and power j comes in your, in your element of Weyl algebra. Uh, with non-zero coefficient and then you take convex hull of this and I'll show you some pictures. Yeah, and of course, um, for Weyl algebra, it's not as sensible as for polynomials saying two variables where it's yeah, very similar to it because it depends on how you decide to record your elements. Here I'm using this record where X goes first and monomial and D goes second, but you can switch it and then it will be changed. But again, not all will be changed and some forms won't be changed. Doesn't matter how you record it. Even if you decide to have monomials where you have X on first place, then D, then X again and so on. So still it would work uh, in a sense that some of the leading forms don't depend on the record and that's the leading forms which we will be looking at. Okay, so here are just a yeah, couple of cases and then general case. So suppose we have, as everybody else, just monic, monic monomial, uh, monic element, element such that yeah, it's monic relative to D and we are trying to find its centralizer. So there is a trivial case when it's just polynomial in D. Then centralizer are just all polynomials in D and nothing else, and it's not very interesting. Now suppose that's more complicated, which means that not all AIs are complex numbers. Some of them are polynomials in X. So what kind of a picture we will see? Because of this D in power N. Okay, I think it's, yeah, okay. 
we will see something like this. So that corresponds to D in power N. Then we say have some edge and then another edge or so something like this. So what would be interesting, we will concentrate our attention on this leading form. So what how the picture and leading forms are connected. We're just looking at, you know, these are endpoints. There are maybe points here inside. And so you're just taking polynomial, yeah, which concentrated on this edge and trying to work with it. So there is a leading form which contains this D in power N. It is, yeah, is not a monomial, right? It's on this picture. It's not a monomial. And of course, here both rho and sigma are positive. So you can assume that this form is behaving like commutative polynomial. And then because Poisson bracket of all leading forms we just want to in this way. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. it's, I just is there. something wrong? Okay. So Poisson bracket commutes the only way for this to happen is that leading form looks like this. It's just D plus some polynomial, uh, some monomial in X in some power N. And that's the only leading form. So in fact, picture looks not like I showed you, but rather like this. And then what you can do, you can do an atomorphism. If you look at it, this form can be collapsed by atomorphism. So what kind of atomorphism of while algebra you can have? If you send X to X and D to D plus this, then it's easy to see that it's actually atomorphism of while algebra. So D goes to this expression. So if you do yeah, inverse atomorphism, you will collapse all that just to D in power N. So what will happen with the picture? That this point will stay put, but this point will shift here. So you will see something smaller, and then you can cry induction, let's say, on area of this triangle. So what does it mean that after series of atomorphisms like this, you will just see D in power N. So what it shows that in fact, that in fact, after some atomorphism like this, you have the centralizer of A is just polynomial ring in this image of D. Or if you, you can open it up, you can say that just all centralizers like this are just polynomials of this kind of expression with some polynomial P of X. Not very interesting. Okay. Second case. So in this first case, it's only polynomials in one variable. And the second case when we have X and power N, that's our leading form, X and power M, D and power N, and you can research it in similar fashion. Okay, and I'm supposed to finish in seven minutes, right? So I better rush. So again, you are trying to research it. You are seeing picture like this. And then it turns out that leading forms, that that kind of a Newton polygon you will see. And what is important that this red line, it's supposed to be red, which connects this vertex with the origin is a leading form. Maybe it consists only of just this monomial. But what is important that it exists and this is a leading form satisfying all conditions. So since I am running out of time, let me show you picture for general case. So in general case, when you have D in power and multiplied by some polynomial in X, you can assume that this polynomial in X um, has zero, yeah, because just by shifting X to X plus C, I don't want it to be here. And then it turns out that again, you have a leading form of this kind, which of course, form of zero weight, yeah, because no matter what are rho and C, this corresponds to monomial one, and that doesn't contain either X nor Y. So that's, this is the form of weight zero. 
So what is important that in all cases, if, and that's only because rank is one, you have a leading form of zero weight. And then it's easy to show that mapping of your polynomial, you have your element of A to this polynomial, which correspond to zero weight form, is actually an isomorphism to ring of polynomials. Because, and it's because of the, uh, the following fact, if you have an element of weight zero, an element which commutes with it, uh, I'm sorry, an element of well algebra with leading form of weight zero and commuting element with that, then um, it must have uh, zero, non-trivial zero form as well. So you, you cannot skip zero form. And because of that, this map would be actually isomorphism. So that's the proof of the fact that you can embed any uh, centralizers of any centralizer of rank one and well algebra in a polynomial ring. So uh, actually, I, 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 I was not sure that that's true and proof turned out to be simple. So let me in remaining five minutes or whatever, even less, tell you what, what can be done. So first of all, it's interesting. Well, it's embedded in polynomial ring, but maybe situation is like in free algebra where, of course, again, it's not too hard to show that centralizer of non-central element in a free associative algebra is a subring of polynomial ring in variable, in one variable. But then there is this brilliant result by Bergman that actually is polynomial ring in one variable. So here it's not the case. And uh, there's plenty of examples, not of the first case, of course, not of Monik, but in the second case, you have plenty of examples like this, and they're all of the following nature. You can find sort of a rational element in, uh, so an element not in Weil algebra, but in the ring of the field of fractions, and since Weil algebra is very close to polynomial ring in two variables, it satisfied left and right or a condition. So there is a well-defined uh, field behind, skew field behind it. And so you always can find an element like this. R of t is up to a change. Well, t is what some people call earlier character. It's product of x and d. So t is just x multiplied d. So you have this. And so this is not an element of Weyl algebra, but powers of this element are in Weyl algebra. And that's how these um, centralizers, of course, since they're polynomials or whatever, yeah, polynomials and one element, they all commute. So that's how you have centralizers, which are not polynomial rings. And uh, here, uh, it, it's, uh, yeah, if you never dealt with it, it's kind of it, yeah, strange. Yeah, you have a rational function power, which is a polynomial. But in this situation, because it's not commutative and because commuting relation of x and t, it's x t is equal to t plus one x. So it's not equal to tx. And because of that, you have this funny thing that if you raise it into sufficiently large power, that's what you will see. That's because t here will be commuting with x. And so you have this polynomial here. And here, because of structure of this, you will see actually this. And so sooner or later, if we take s of t, to be a polynomial, which has only simple roots and negative integers. So for sufficiently large t, this will take care of s of t and it will become polynomial. So that's that's about what I unfortunately have to say now, but uh, still uh, it was interesting. What else can be said? And even can I describe all centralizers? It turns out that I cannot, even if I take two operators, one of order two and other of order three, and want to describe all of them, then it boils down to the following polynomial equation. Uh, excuse me, Danny, uh, no. your time is up. Yes, my time is up, yeah, okay. So my time is up, so anyway, <laughs> think about it. Yeah, you have polynomial f and z, and this ratio must be a polynomial. So to describe all polynomials like this is a challenge. Anyway, thank you very much. Once again, Veselin, yeah, you reached important milestone, but I hope that yeah, 
we will have opportunity maybe to work together, to talk together for many years to come. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Any questions? So let me stop share. And if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer. Okay. Well, going, 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 going. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So if you are interested, the paper appeared, I think, in Sigma, and you can look at it. And yeah, there is yeah, extensive literature on this topic. Thank you. So, okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Your lecture. So uh, the. Next lecture is by Daniela Lamazina from the University of Palermo, and she will be talking on, she will be speaking on co dimensions of algebra with additional standards. Please go ahead. Yes, Please. yes, one moment because I have a problem here. Okay. Mm. Uh, okay, uh, I'll let you. Only yeah. me. Okay, okay. Um, Sorry, I have always some problem. Okay, I'll try to do this. We hear you very well, so. Uh... Okay. Um, okay, I don't know why. Okay, um, it's a very pleasure to have the possibility to give a talk here uh, in occasion of uh, the anniversary of Vesely Andreski. I want to wish him many happy returns and uh, i want also to thank the organizing committee for organizing such an interesting conference so now i'll start with mathematics i'm uh, going to talk on co-dimensions of algebras with additional structures but I'll start by presenting some results in the setting of ordinary algebras satisfying polynomial identities. I don't know why. <laughs> okay, there is a, often some problem. Okay, uh, here A is an associative algebra over a field of characteristic zero and uh, for facts denotes the free associative algebra on a countable set X over F. We know that a polynomial, ident a polynomial identity for A is just a polynomial of the free algebra which vanishes on A. If A, satisfies a non-zero, a non-trivial polynomial identity, we say that A is a PI algebra. Now, the set of all polynomial identities satisfied by, by A is denoted by height of A and uh, is a T-ideal of the free algebra. I mean, it is an ideal invariant under all endomorphisms of the free algebra. Moreover, every T ideal of the free algebra is of this type. I mean, it is the T ideal of all polynomial identities satisfied by a suitable algebra. So sometimes it is convenient to translate a given problem on T ideals of the free algebra in the language of polynomial identities satisfied by an algebra. In 1950, SPECT raised a problem which was one of the main driving forces in the theory for more than 35 years. Is every proper T ideal of the free associative algebra finitely generated as a T ideal? It was affirmatively solved by Kemmer in 1987. So in the language of the polynomial identities, we can say that an associative algebra has a finite basis of polynomial identities. So it would be interesting to try to find a set of generators of a given T ideal, but uh, it's not so easy. And uh, there are not so many examples of uh, T ideals completely described by a set of generators. So, 
But let me show some examples for which a set of generators is known. The TIDL of the field F is generated by a commutator of length two. For UT2, the algebra of two by two upper triangular matrices, so we have that the TIDL is generated by a product of two commutators of length two. For the infinite dimensional Grassmann algebra, a set of generators is also known, and it is generated by a commutator of length three. And also, uh, it's known a set of generators of the TIDL of M to half, the algebra of two by two matrices, and uh, it is generated by uh, the so-called uh, Wagner all identity and by the polynomial standard of degree four. I want to remark that for M3, a set of generators is not yet known. For this reason, in order to study a TIDL, one can determine some numerical invariance uh, that allow to get a description of it. And a very useful numerical invariant that can be can uh, use uh, is given by the sequence of codimensions that I'll define in a few seconds. But first, let me say that in characteristic zero, uh, I do k is completely determined by its multilinear part for the well-known multilinearization process. So if we denote uh, by Pn the vector space of multilinear polynomials in the first n variables, we have that the height of k is generated by this subspace. Okay, um, now we consider this quotient, this quotient, and we call the dimension of uh, this uh, quotient the nth dimension of A. And the corresponding sequence is, the, is called the codimension sequence of A. Obviously, the study of uh, uh, the sequence of codimensions of an algebra gives a lot of information about the polynomial identities satisfied by A. Let me show some uh, examples for uh, the codimensions of the field F are equal to one. The codimensions of UT2 are known and uh, were determined by Latishoff and they are two to the N minus one times N minus two plus two. For the Grassmann algebra, the codimensions was, uh, uh, were determined by krakowski regeff and they are equal to two to the hell minus one. And uh, uh, for MK, we have the asymptotics, the codimensions grow like a constant, and this constant uh, was completely, uh, explicitly uh, um, computed by Regeff. And uh, uh, then we have n uh, to minus one half uh, k squared, which is the dimension of the algebra minus one and the k squared to the n. Okay, now such a sequence is uh, bounded from above by the dimension of uh, the, the space of multilinear polynomials, which is equal to n factorial. But in, uh, in case A is a PI algebra, uh, Regeff proved that such a sequence is exponentially bounded. Moreover, um, Kemmer proved later that uh, always for PI algebra, such a sequence is polynomially bounded if and only if the variety generated by A does not contain the Grassmann algebra and UT2. As a consequence of uh, this result, we have that uh, such a sequence is either polynomially bounded or grows exponentially. Moreover, for such a sequence, there is no intermediate growth between polynomial and exponential. Moreover, the varieties generated by G and UT2 are the only varieties of almost polynomial growth, 
I mean that they grow exponentially, but an improper cell variety is polynomially bounded. And uh, here, the growth of a variety is the growth of the sequence of codimensions of a generating algebra. In the 1980s, to make conjectures about the asymptotic behavior of the codimensions were made. The first one is the Amitsu's conjecture. For any PI algebra, uh, the limit of the nth group of the codimensions exists and is a non negative integer, and the Regev's conjecture. For any PI algebra, there exists a constant C, a semi integer Q, and an integer, a non negative integer, such that the codimensions grow asymptotically like a constant, a polynomial part, m to the Q, and an exponential part. Now, the, the first conjecture was uh, approved in 1999 by Gianbruno Zaisef. They proved that for a PI algebra, the codimensions satisfy these inequalities. Hence, the limit of the n group of Cm exists and is a non negative integer, and it is called the exponent of the algebra. Let me show some examples. Uh, for the exponent, we have that the exponent of the field uh, obviously is equal to one. The exponent of ut2 and g uh, is equal to two. And the exponent of mk is equal to k squared. Okay, um, Jamruno and Zaisef in uh, their paper also uh, showed the um, showed how to compute the exponent of an algebra in case the, the field is algebraically closed. And uh, I want to show it. So uh, B is a super algebra and G is the Grassmann algebra, which has a natural Z2 grading where G0 and G1 are the spans of the monomial in the generators of even and odd length respectively. Okay, the Grassmann envelope of B is just the direct sum of the tensor product of the homogeneous uh, component of uh, G and B, and uh, the tensor product of the homogeneous component of the Greek one. Now, Kemmer proved in 1988 that if A is PI, a satisfies the same identities as the Grassmann envelope of a finite dimensional superalgebra. Now assume that the field F is algebraically closed and B uh, is always a superalgebra, a finite dimensional superalgebra, so we can write B as the direct sum of the semi-simple part which is a subalgebra, a Z2 graded subalgebra. And here there is J, and J is the Jacobson radical, which is also a graded ideal of B. So uh, they proved that, <coughs> John Ruhn Zeitzer proved that the exponent of A is equal to the exponent of the Grassmann envelope of B. This uh, follows from the result of Kemmer and it is equal to the maximal dimension of an admissible subalgebra of B. B is the semi simple part that we can write as the direct sum of uh, simple superalgebras in this way. But let me recall what is an admissible subalgebra. Okay, a semi simple subalgebra, C1 plus CT, where C1 and CT are distinct superalgebras from this set, is admissible if this product is different from zero. So we have an easy way to compute the exponent once B is known. Now uh, let's consider the Regev conjecture. 
It was uh, solved by Beryl and Regeff in 2008 for PI algebras with one. In fact, they proved that the codimensions grow asymptotically like a constant and to the t. And uh, here we have the exponent of a two to the n. And t is half integer. Moreover, since John Lorenzais proved that the sequence of codimensions is eventually non-decreasing, we have that uh, from the paper, it follows also that for any PI algebra, also without unit, uh, the codimensions satisfies these inequalities. So here we have the same polynomial part, which is equal, which is a half integer. So in this, uh, in this way, we get a second invariant of a T ideal after the exponent, which is the limit of uh, the logarithm of Cn over the exponent of A to, to the n. And uh, I call it, for simplicity, the polynomial part of A. Okay, let me show some examples for which the polynomial part is a norm. Here uh, we have the exponent, we have seen that the exponent of mk is a, a square and the polynomial part of mk is a minus one half a square a minus one. For uh, the q by q upper triangular matrix algebra, we have that the exponent is equal to q and the polynomial part is q minus one. For the upper block triangular matrix algebra, p d1, dq, we have that the exponent is equal to d1 squared plus dq squared, and the polynomial part uh, is equal to minus one alpha, here we have the exponent, minus q, minus q plus q minus one. Okay, but uh, these algebras we have seen here in these examples, actually are particular cases of the so-called fundamental or basic algebras for which the polynomial part was explicitly computed and related to the structure of the algebra. So let me recall something about the fundamental algebras. Here we have a finite dimensional algebra over an algebraically closed field. And we can write A hey, as the direct as the sum of the semi-simple part and the Jacobs radical. And the, I recall this definition, the TS index of A is a couple made up of the dimension of the semi-simple part and SA, which is the nilpotence index of the Jacobson radical minus one. Okay, there is also a notion of a Kemmer index determined by the existence of suitable multi-alternating polynomials, which are not identities of A, but I give the definition later when I'll speak, I'll talk about algebras with additional structures. Here, let me only say that an algebra is called fundamental if the TS index of A is equal to the Kemmer index of A. Okay, uh, for fundamental algebras, the polynomial part was uh, computed by Aljadaf, Janssen, and Karasik in 2017. And the proof that if A is uh, fundamental, the polynomial part is equal to minus one alpha, here we have the exponent, minus Q, where Q is the number of the simple algebras which appear in the decomposition of the semi-simple part, plus the nilpotence index of the Jacobson radical minus one. So in the light of uh, this formula, 
let me uh, show uh, the examples that we have seen before. Okay, for MK, we have that the polynomial part uh, we have seen is equal to this. In fact, uh, the, uh, this is just k square is the exponent minus one because uh, it is uh, simple. We have only one component and the SA for MK is equal to zero. For UTQ, we have that the, the first part is equal to zero because uh, you remember the exponent of u to q is equal to q. So this is zero and q minus one is just this uh, s a. And for uh, u t d one d q we have uh, okay q components q simple components and s a is equal to q minus one. Moreover, uh, it, it, we have that any finite dimensional algebra has the same polynomial identities as a finite direct sum of fundamental algebras. So for this result, we recover the results we have seen before, the barrel regaps results for a finite dimensional algebra. Let me see if uh, about, uh, I try to, okay, I mean, one moment, I mean this fact, this result that the polynomial part is determined and there is a, a, a integer. Okay, actually we recovered this result also for finitely generated algebras since a finitely generated algebra satisfies the same identities as a finite dimensional algebra. Okay. Okay, now we generalize the results we have seen so far in the setting of super algebras and algebras with involution. So A is an associative algebra, is a, a associative phi algebra, where phi is an automorphism or an anti-automorphism of order less or equal than two. Here I'm including also the trivial case. So we can write A as the direct sum of two subspaces, A0, phi, which is the, uh, the set of elements of A, which are fixed by phi, and A1, phi is the set of elements that change the sign under the action of uh, phi. If phi is an anti-automorphism, so if there is an involution, we have that A0, phi, and a one phi are just the subspaces of the symmetric and the skew elements respectively. While if phi is an automorphism, we have that k is a z graded algebra, a super algebra, and a zero phi and a one phi are just the homogeneous components of degree zero and one respectively. Now we have the, the free associative phi algebra. And in a natural way, it's possible to give the definition of a phi identity for a phi algebra. I skip it. And the set of all phi identities of A uh, is a T phi ideal of uh, the free algebra. I mean, it is invariant under all endomorphisms of the free algebra commuting with phi. Okay, as for the ordinary case, we have a positive answer to the spec problem, and it is a result of Aljadef, Jean Bruno Karasik for algebras with involution and for super algebras, actually for G graded algebras. It is our, where G is a finite group, it is our result of Aljadef Bello. That um, they prove this uh, result for any finite G group. And this video proved this result for uh, abelian finite groups.
Okay, also for uh, also here, uh, I had uh, um, this TFI ideal is completely determined by its multilinear part, and uh, we denote by PN phi the vector space of multilinear polynomials of degree n, and uh, the dimension of this space is called the nth phi codimension of A. Okay, uh, obviously, uh, such a sequence is bounded from above by, by the dimension of this space, which is 2 to the n and factorial. And in K, uh, for PI algebras, John Bruno and Regev proved that uh, such a sequence is exponentially bounded. Okay, now uh, consider the conjectures of Amitsur and Regev in the setting of uh, phi algebras. So in this setting, the Amitsur conjecture was solved and uh, was solved by, let me see, <laughs> Benanti, Gian Bruno and Pipitone for uh, finitely generated super algebras and uh, uh, by Aljadaf, Gian Bruno and myself, uh, uh, in a different com uh, composition of names and paper for superalgebras, actually for G graded algebras, where G is a finite group, and by Jamun and Zaisef for fine dimensional algebras with involution, and for generally um, algebras with involution was proved by John Bruno, Polsino, and Valenti. So uh, the sequence of codimensions satisfies these uh, inequalities, and so the limit of the unroof of the phi codimensions exists, and is called the phi exponent of, uh, of A. Okay, now what about the Regev's conjecture? It was proved for finite dimensional phi simple algebras. In fact, in case phi is an anti-automorphism of order two, so uh, we are in the setting of algebra with involution, we have that the finite dimensional phi simple algebras are two k equivalents only of these types. Here we have nk with transpose or symplectic involution, and we have here nk plus its opposite algebra with exchange involution. For nk with transpose or symplectic involution, Beryl, Jan Bruno, and Regaf proved that the, co the codimensions, the phi codimensions, uh, grew asymptotically like constant. Uh, n, and the here, the, what I called the before polynomial part is uh, minus one half, and uh, this is the dimension of uh, the, the skew part, and uh, uh, this is uh, the exponent to, to the n. Uh, the codimensions of the third algebra so was computed by Gian Bruno, Pulsina, and myself, and uh, we proved that the codimensions grow asymptotically like uh, a constant n uh, to uh, minus one half. Here we have always uh, the dimension of this q part, minus one times the exponent uh, to, to the n. Okay, uh, in the setting of algebras or super algebras, Finite dimensional phi simple algebras are of these uh, types. We have a MK half, a block matrix algebra, and we have this algebra, the direct sum of MF uh, and M and F, where phi here is the exchange automorphism. And for uh, Okay, for uh, the super algebras, actually for the G graded simple algebras, so where G is a finite uh, uh, group, the result was obtained by Karasik and Spiegelman, uh, who proved that the codimensions grow asymptotically like a constant and N, and uh, we have minus one half, and here we have the dimensions of the homogeneous component of degree zero minus one times the exponent of uh, the algebra to, to the n. 
Okay, so for uh, uh, <coughs> okay, so for finer dimension by simple algebra, uh, the gap conjecture holds. Okay, uh, now we have uh, we have seen that for uh, um, phi algebras, the codimensions satisfies these inequalities. Now one can ask, uh, does the barrel regaf result hold? I mean, is K1 equal to K, K2 or this is this part, or equivalently, does uh, this limit exist? And if it exists, is a half integer? So we have a positive answer for a finitely generated phi algebras. And we got this result through the, uh, the so-called fundamental phi algebras. Okay. Now, uh, let A be a fine dimensional phi algebra over an algebraically closed field. We can write A as uh, the, the sum of the semi-simple part and the Jacobson radical. Okay, and uh, a multilinear phi polynomial F is alternating on a set of variables if f vanishes whenever we identify any two of these variables. For instance, x1 phi x2 minus x2 x1 phi is not alternating, while x1 x2 phi minus x2 uh, x1 phi is alternating. So it's important that the, the position of uh, phi is uh, in uh, any monomial is fixed. Okay, we have seen before the definition of uh, TS index. It's a couple uh, made up of the dimension of uh, the semi-simple part and uh, uh, the impotence index of the Jacobson radical minus one. Now, let a bit of A be the greatest integer T such that for every mu there exists a multilinear phi polynomial, uh, which is not a phi identity for A, alternating in the mu sets Xi of cardinality T. And we define gamma of A as the greatest integer S such that for every mu there exists a multilinear phi polynomial, which is not a phi identity of A alternating in the new sets Xi of cardinalità beta of A and in the SS uh, zeta J of cardinality beta of A plus one. Okay, the Kemer phi index of A is for us this couple, bit of A and the gamma of A. And we say that an algebra A is phi fundamental if the TS index of A is equal to the, the Kemer phi index of A. Okay, now we have this result for uh, phi fundamental algebras. So if phi is an anti-automorphism uh, of order two, I mean, if phi is an involution, we have that if A is phi fundamental, then the codimension, uh, the codimensions satisfies these inequalities. And this is the polynomial part. So this and this are equal, is equal to minus one half. And here we have the dimension of the skew elements of the semi-simple part minus R uh, plus S, where R is just the number here, the number here of the uh, phi simple algebras, which appear here, uh, which are not simple algebras. So they are of the type MK plus MK, the opposite. 
Okay, and this is the result for five fundamental algebra, uh, algebras in the setting of algebras with involution. In the setting of algebras of super algebras, we have this result. Um, so if phi is always fundamental, the codimension satisfies these uh, inequalities and the polynomial part here is minus one half. Here we have the dimensions of the homogeneous component of degree zero minus Q. Here uh, appears, um, here Q is the number of all phi simple algebras. And S is always the uh, hypotenuse index of the Jacobson radical minus one. Okay, now uh, every finite dimensional phi algebra has the same phi identities as a finite direct sum of phi fundamental algebras. So, by using also this result that a finitely generated PI phi algebra satisfies the same identities as a fine dimensional phi algebra, we get that. If A is a finitely generated pi phi algebra over a field of characteristics zero, then the codimensions satisfies these inequalities and the polynomial part, which is this limit, exists and is a half integer. So, so uh, we recovered the result of Beryl Regaf in uh, the setting of uh, uh, phi algebras. Okay, that's all. Thank you for your attention. Uh, are there questions? Remarks? That doesn't seem to be the case. So Dear colleagues, we start the last session for today. I give the floor to Viktor Petrogradsky from the University of Brasilia with his talk, Phoenix Restricted Lie Algebras. Please, you um, get the floor. Uh, good morning, good evening to everybody. I hope that you can hear me. I am happy to talk at the um, Jubilee Conference in honor of Fisilin. Uh, he is very uh, bright mathematician, so you can shoot at any place in algebra and find his results. So uh, my talk is close to the following subject. First of all, uh, growth. Fisilin likes different kinds of growth, right? And also um, it is related to Kuras problem, which is the origin of uh, uh, PI series. So it's related to the growth and Kuras problem. Uh, let's. Uh, the title will be explained before why Phoenix. Why is Phoenix built here? Okay, let's start with uh, reminded you Burnside and Kuras problem. Uh, Burnside problem asks if uh, a finitely generated group of a fixed exponent is finite. The answer no was given by Novik Fadian, but this is a, a bounded Burnside problem. There is a general Burnside problem. Is a finitely generated periodic group finite? First, the answer was given to this problem. It was made in wonderful example of Golod and Shefarevich in 64. They constructed for each prime a, a bunch of finitely generated infinite P groups. Uh, further examples were constructed by Grigorchuk and Gupta Sitki. Uh, there is a closely related general Kuras problem. Is a finitely generated algebraic associative algebra finite dimensional? Uh, again, first, the answer is no, was given by Golden Shefarevich. Uh, they constructed a family of finitely generated infinite dimensional associative new algebras. And using this example, they constructed uh, that famous uh, periodic p-groups. Uh, this construction was essentially modified by Tlenagan and Smoktonovich, and they constructed associative new algebras of uh, uh, polynomial growth, because uh, originally construction of Bullock yields uh, associative new algebra of exponential growth. So this talk is closely related to Kuras problem. 
Let me recall you the definition of the Gregorchuk group. Let T be a, the infinite binary rooted traits depicted on the left. A and B, it's automorphism, where A flips the halves of the tree. What are doing B? B, he is depicting the same tree, but A it flips the half of the tree, which are hanging over there, over there. This is identity permutation and so on. And we have B, C, D, automorphism defined in this recursive way. Uh, clearly, one checks that group generated B, C, D is a Klein group. But uh, when we, Grigorchuk, uh, considered the all, in fact, it's sufficient to consider A, B, and C, and this is famous Grigorchuk group. Let me uh, recall some basic property of this group. So there are many interesting, but I'm just recalling basic. First of all, uh, the group is infinite. All right. Second, it is quite interesting. It's periodic. So for each A, it's raised into some degree of two, it's one. Probably I should write here E for group series, but okay, it's R. And uh, next, um, Grigorchuk found that it's of intermediate type. The growth is of intermediate type. It has behavior of this kind where lambda is between one and one and a half. Uh, the bounds were different, but I just to give you an idea of the growth of this group. Only recently, the growth of the Grigorchuk group was determined in the following way. Uh, first of all, the upper bound, boy, no, some upper bound was found by Grigorchuk. But this upper bound written here, the exponent n to raise to the sigma, where sigma is this uh, number, was obtained in Bartholdi, is 98. But recently, Ershel and Chunk proved that this actually is a lower bound. Uh, so the growth function has this kind of behavior, where lambda zero is the root of this polynomial. This is here. So it's intermediate, it's, okay. Uh, in case of um, Lie algebra, there is a question of nility. The periodicity is replaced by nility. Uh, Jacobson, in his book, asks the question, is a finitely generated restricted Lie algebra a finite dimensional provided that any x acts in algebraic way? It's written in his book. Actually, Gollot in his talk uh, gave example of infinite dimensional finitely generated Lie algebras such that at are nil, but uh, the degree of nility depends on x and y. So modifying this example, one easily gets um, a negative answer to the Jacobson question that one obtains infinite dimensional, finitely generated, restrictedly algebras with a nil premapping. Uh, so this kind of um, analog of the Golot example, but I think that it's, there is no place when this point is clearly formulated. And uh, in 2006, uh, I constructed an example of two generated restricted Lie algebra of polynomial growth with a NLP mapping in characteristic two, which may be thought as an analog of the Grigorchuk group. Uh, I will later describe this example in more details. This example was extended to arbitrary prime characteristic by Shostakov and Zelman. And there were further developments. Uh, there is a close result of Bakhtulin and Shansky. They constructed some kind of new P algebras that are images of restricted li large restricted Lie algebras, which are expected to have exponential growth. And there are more examples by me, by Shostakov, Bartholdi, the example of Lucy P algebras and so on. And um, let me formulate this um, analog of the Grigorchuk um, group. Um, I called it Fibonacci Lie algebra because it's closely related to Fibonacci numbers. Uh, first of all, we consider polynomial ring and partial derivations. Uh, these derivations denoted in this way, and we consider uh, two operators, V1, V2, which are written as infinite sum of derivation in this way. Uh, it defines the Fibonacci Lie algebra as the Lie algebra generated by these two derivations. It lies inside derivation ring of this K of T of infinite many variables. And um, there is some kind of self-similarity structure here. We can define shift when each variables go to the next one. Then clearly V2 is the image of V1. Also, um, 
it can be, we can define the I as the further images of P1, which can be written on this infinite sum or recursive way. This recursive way actually leads to a um, Fibonacci relation. Uh, one easily check that the commutator of two neighboring VIs is the next one. So this is the Fibonacci kind of relation. And we, if we multiply log the neighboring elements, then we get some the next Vj plus one times some product of this. The commutator is a little more complicated than this Fibonacci relation. And what are the basic properties of this uh, Lie algebra? Uh, up to now, this Lie algebra lives in any characteristic. Uh, I don't know the description of the growth of this Lie algebra in zero characteristic, for example. I definitely know that it's over, over polynomial, but I don't know the exact uh, description of the growth. Uh, now we come to positive characteristic. In this case, we consider truncated polynomials. Uh, in consider restricted Lie algebra generated by V1 and V2. In this case, in characteristic two, there is a square map, which is equal, is given by this relation. Uh, in characteristic two, in characteristic three, by this relation. And what are the basic properties? In characteristic two and three, this is the work with Ivan Shostakov. Lambda is the golden ratio. Consider restricted Lie algebra generated by V1 and V2. We know the gelfand kirillov dimension of this Lie algebra. For P is equal to two is this one number, 1.44 approximately. We can consider also the associative hull of these operators and gelfand kirillov dimension is twice this number. Uh, the most interesting part that it, this Lie algebra has nil P mapping. This is the analog of periodicity of the Grigorchuk group. Why it can be considered as an analog of the Grigorchuk group. And uh, the last property is analog of the periodicity of the Grigorchuk and gupta sitki group. There is also gupta sitki group, which is very important, but I have no time to describe it here. And um, using some technique, we are able to show that our Lie algebra is Z2 graded by the multi-degree the generators. Here we have a description of the homogeneous components. So we have V1, this is one generator, this point is V1. And this is V2. And here we have the dimension of multi-homogeneous component of this algebra. Using some geometrical ideas, it is um, convenient to prove some properties of this Lie algebra. And the another uh, origin of this talk is the following result of Kassabov and Pak. Suppose that we have a four monotone functions. F1 and F2, this is some kind of interval between F1 and F2, and G1, Gn, G2. And here on the left, we have the, the growth of the Grigorchuk group, which was discussed above. And there are some technical conditions on this function, which are very difficult to explain and describe here. So there are technical conditions. Uh, they construct that there exists a finitely generated group, which growth functions visits this interval between F1 and F2 and G1, G2 infinitely many times. So it's oscillated between two um, okay, strips, this strip and this one. It jumps from one to another one. Uh, because this is um, groups, group of oscillating growth. And the upper bound F, F2 can be very close to the exponential growth, exponential function. And but what they construct, um, it's not definitely not a periodic group. There is another uh, construction similar to this area. It's an uh, example of Bell and Zelmanov. They describe the possible growth function of associative algebra. This is another story. So I don't touch this subject. And now uh, uh, we describe our example, which is the goal of this talk. It is called Phoenix aesthetic Lie algebra. So why? Let's see. We fix a prime and some parameters, natural number, sigma, lambda depends on the characteristic. As there exists a three generated restricted Lie algebra with oscillating intermediate growth. What does it mean? Uh, let's have uh, for any epsilon delta, the growth function visit infinitely many of this, this trip infinite many ways. So 
Let's consider this trip. We have exponent of n divided by power of a logarithm raised into lambda on both sides. But we need, we, we need to have a strip. So the upper function bigger than the lower function. So we put here plus epsilon, right? But there is also on the right delta, any positive delta. Whatever epsilon and delta we choose, the right uh, side of the interval is always bigger than the left side of the interval beginning with some number. So we have a strip. And the claim is that we visit this strip infinitely many ways. Our algebra shall visit infinitely many ways this algebra. This is a high kind of growth. Not exponential, but fast uh, sub-exponential growth. Um, so there's another period. So the group, the algebra is having a good time with high growth and there is a low growth. What is low growth? Uh, we say quasi-linear growth. Why quasi-linear? We have n times some power of an iterated logarithm. If we put iteration of a logarithm, this is a, some kind of a slowly growing function. Um, why it's quasi-linear? Linear when we put n times constant. But here we have some slowly growing function. Uh, with, with respect to the gelfan kirillov dimension, when we formally compute it, the decay dimension is exactly one. So this guy disappears. On both sides, we have decay dimension one. But we, we, we need to have a segment, real segment. We put here minus epsilon, here plus epsilon. So we have uh, some uh, strip by putting epsilon as small as possible, we get our strip slow, narrow and narrow and narrow. And this claim is that the algebra is visiting this segment infinitely, this, in, this strip infinitely many ways. So why Phoenix algebra? Because it almost dies, right? It resurrects, dies and resurrects, dies and resurrects. Why it's, I'm saying is dying? Because uh, it also related to the famous gap statement due to Bergman. Uh, Bergman's theorem says that GK dimension of associative algebra cannot belong to the interval one, two. For Lie algebras, this gap kind of statement is not valid. It was shown in 97. And so, and also why quasi-linear growth is interesting because uh, for any algebra, it is either finite dimension or GK dimension one. And we put, when we try to put this lowest bound, we get group function like n plus one. This is lowest possible non-finite dimension algebra is having growth like n plus one. So we are very close to the being infinite dimensional. So um, we skip back and forth from two kinds of behavior. And because of this, uh, let's call this Phoenix algebra. And this is the third statement. The third statement says that the growth is always between this kind of behavior because one and two is not sufficient. It says that sometimes algebra behaving in this way. Uh, what if it, for some n it's going to be exponential? And the third claim is says that we are exactly staying in the region determined by this function and this function. So for any epsilon delta starting with some n, we are in this angle formed by this function and this function. Uh, this is the behavior of uh, mm, our restricted algebra. Why it's close to the Kurash problem? Because we, we have the fourth statement. The P, the P mapping is nil. So it's analog of Kurash problem. We are constructing nil object, which is infinite dimensional with a, such a strange kind of growth behavior. And when we look at the claims one and two, you, you can imagine that it's achieved. Uh, you always to construct next time when it's growing fast and low should wait very long time. So, but this is the main statement. Now I want to say a little bit about ideas. We call, construct so-called families of fruit flies or drosophilas. Fix K at least three and letters, K letters. 
recursively construct words in our original alphabet called fruit flies or drosophilus. Uh, theta zero are flies of generation zero. Suppose that flies of generation N are constructed. Each pair of distinct flies produces two kids, AB and BA of the next generation. So our flies are multiplying only once. Generation N gives rise to kids of generation N plus one. It's logical to call A is a father, B and a mother, but for BA, B is a father and a mother. Probably the correct notion is we should say about the first parent and second parent. So gender of a fly is de determined by their kids. So for one it's father, for, for another it's mother. So um, uh, we are constructing. So this construction is gives a unique set of fruit flies, but we have experimenter which likes to experiment with our drosophilus, and it collects flies of generation n plus one and selects some subset, and the, the rest are in the ethical ways eliminated. Let me put a generation family; it's whole species of flies. Uh, in fact, we are constructing a language in the original alphabet consisting of binary length words. This, this is kind of words. Uh, suppose that initially we have only two flies. Then the next variation only A, B, and B, A. We need to have a subset. Either we have all two flies forever or species extinct. So the experimenter is required to have at least three flies in each generation. So at the origin, we have three flies. And uh, depending on the selection process, we obtain different sets of flies called species of flies. If experimenter makes no selection, we get so-called wild species. It's uniquely determined by zero generation in our process. So the growth in terms of the number of words of length n is this one. So in respect to the length is exponential growth because length of the word in theta a to the n is exponent here. And then this is one kind of side of the story. There is another side of the story, triplex or clava species of fly. All, all generations have free flies. Suppose the generation zero have free flies exactly. They give rise to six kids, right? But we need to select um, three of them. We select any of them and leave any of them, and so on. The growth of species is logarithmical, so it's um, species it's almost dormant. They are not multiplying. And so we define, we consider hybrid species of flies. Uh, consider integers. <clears throat> and for any fixed segment, uh, species behaves wild or triplex, and so on. And we natural way define the growth of a species counting number of the bone flies up till now. And constructing hybrid species, we lose exponential growth because it's, we have a strange phenomenon that we can construct hybrid species with sometimes in any finite segment is exponential, but in general, we lose exponential growth. But we can make the growth faster than any sub exponential growth. Uh, Suppose that we have three flies in any fixed sub-exponential sequence. There exists a hybrid species with accelerating growth. Growth of the whole generation is sub-exponential. Theta has periods of slow growth, sometimes, and periods of fast growth. It's bigger than any given sub-exponential growing function. And now um, we construct our Lie algebra using constructed oscillating species of flies. Uh, we fix a species of flies, consider truncated polynomial ring, and consider respective partial derivations. Actually, we, to achieve quasi-linear growth, which is interesting for us, we need divided power algebra. I am not defining it here. Uh, define the carcel derivation indexed by our flies called virtual pivot aggregates. Now, the A is derivative indexed by fly A, times T times B and VAB is, is actually pivot element, which is written for all uh, kids of A for which A is a father. And for any fly, we get a sum of 
of all the sandals of A, expanding this recursive presentation, we have a, such a sum, which for any given A is written over all descendants of A, which are grand grandfather, for which A is grand grandfather. Um, this is the construction. And uh, there are two extreme cases. Uh, that, that we have a species of flies is zero generation. We define restricted algebra generated by private elements constructing responding to the zero generation. In case of a wide family of flies, we get an intermediate growth like this one. So um, we get a species of white flies. And when we, the species is completely wild, we are having a uh, restricted algebra, which has such a kind of growth behavior. It's always behaving in this way. And uh, we have a principal difficulty that our algebra has no good monomial basis, and there is a lot of work to overcome this. And wild segments are responsible for fast growth segments. And there is also triplex segment, which are responsible for quasi-linear growth. This is another kind of story. And later we need to glue them together and so on and so on. It proves that we have a nility question. So um, I think I should stop here because uh, my time is almost over. Yeah, thank you. Let's thank you. Professor Petrogradsky for his talk. Any questions, comments? I don't see. If there are no questions. Let's thank again to Viktor Petrogradsky. The next talk is Universal Enveloping Algebras, Free Jordan Algebras, and their Associative Graded Algebras. The speaker is Ivan Shestekov from the University of San Paulo. Please, Professor Shestekov. Uh, thank you, Tsetska. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to contribute in this event dedicated to anniversary of Veseline. I congratulate you, Veseline, and wish you all the best. First of all, health, many new results, theorems. Of course, it would be better to do it personally, but I hope you will. Uh, we have many meetings in future and can do this. <clears throat> okay, the title of my talk was already announced. So please, uh, the next page, please. Veseline. Can you put? Okay, the definition of Jordan algebra was already given. It's commutative algebra, which satisfies this Jordan identity. <clears throat> For an algebra A, A plus means denote the adjoint commutative algebra with this symmetric no multiplication. And when it is well known, when A is associative, then A plus is a Jordan algebra. And the Jordan algebra J is called special if it's isomorphic to some subalgebra of A plus when where A is associative. Otherwise, this algebra Jordan is called exceptional. And there are, contrary to Lie algebras, for instance, there exist exceptional Jordan algebras. Well, with any Jordan algebra J, uh, the two universal associative algebras can be associated. Uh, the universal associative envelope in algebra S of J with the universal homomorphism from J to, this is associative algebra, from J to uh, S of J plus. And this object is, S of J is the universal object for specializations of J. This is 
for homomorphism of J in two special Jordan algebras. And another algebra, uh, it's universal multiplicative envelope algebra, U of J, also with has universal linear mapping of J into this algebra. It is a, this is a universal object for representations of uh, uh, algebra J. Well, a specialization, as I mentioned already, of Jordan algebra J is just a homomorphism of J into A plus into this Jordan algebra when A is associative. In other words, it's linear and uh, satisfies this relation, it's homomorphism. A representation of a Jordan algebra is a linear mapping uh, to associative algebra, which a little more complicated identity. It satisfies these two identities. In fact, uh, for a vector space V, a linear map, mapping of rho of J to algebra of homomorphism is a Jordan representation of J if and only if the split null extension of J plus V with the commutative action of J on V induced by rho is a Jordan algebra. In this case, V is called a Jordan bimodal over J. So representations uh, related with bimodulus. For any specialization phi, the half of this specialization is a representation. So there is one can consider specializations as a partial case of representations. Such representations are called one-sided or semi-unital because one acts as a half, let's say. They more or less correspond uh, while journal bimodals, well, associative bimodal or associative algebras also produce Jordan by model. Uh, but if we have, say, a right associative model, we can turn it into by model by uh, acting from the left by uh, as zero, and then it will obtain this half uh, uh, Jordan model, uh, one half model. Well, for a unit of J, the algebra S of J is an ideal. Uh, this uh, universal associative uh, enveloping is an ideal of universal multiplicative enveloping. For any specialization, there exists a unique homomorphism associative algebras uh, from S of J such that uh, this uh, specialization can be obtained by the composition of universal mapping and this uh, homomorphism. Uh, similarly, for any representation, also there exists unique homomorphism of associative algebras, which such that uh, this representation is composition of universal mapping and this homomorphism. In particular, there is isomorphism of categories of Jordan by model over J and associative models over multiplicative universal envelope in algebra. Uh, the universal homomorphism of a J into universal associative algebras is injective if and only if the algebra J is special. While the universal mapping into universal multiplicative algebra is always injective. <clears throat> These algebras, universal algebras, play important role for the structure theory and representations of Jordan algebras. Many important results in Jordan theory have been proved by using relations between properties of an algebra J and of its universe and enveloping algebras. Uh, as I already mentioned, uh, are not contrary to, the, contrary to the Lie algebra case, there are no canonical base for these two algebras, S of J and U of J. On the other hand, well, this is disadvent uh, how to say, disadventure. But on the other hand, these algebras are more closely related to the algebra J. For instance, if J is finite dimensional, then so are both S of J and U of J. Uh, these algebras uh, were described completely for semi-simple finite dimensional Jordan algebras. He proved that they are also semi-simple, finite dimensional, and hence, hence every Jordan by model uh, over semi-simple Jordan algebras, finite dimensional, is completely reducible, and all the reducible finite dimensional by models were classified by Jacobson. Uh, recently, the representations of not semi-simple Jordan algebras began to be studied, and some results on the structure of the universal envelope in algebras in a non-semi-simple case we obtained. Well, it was in papers by 
Ирина Кашуба, Сергей Овсиенко и myself, and also with Ирина Кашуба with Вера Серганова. Well, some more results on the algebras, this universal algebras I will mention. Let log and red uh, locally nilpotent and Jacobson radicals. If J is special, then we have the locally nilpotent radical of J. It's just in section of the corresponding uh, radical of uh, associative enveloping algebra and J. And the same true is for uh, Jacobson radical. Uh, in general case, when algebra is not special, then for locally nilpotent algebra and universal multiplicative algebra, we have the same things, but it is not true for Jacobson radical. In general, uh, Jacobson radical of J is not lying in the radical of universal multiplicative algebra. Just it's sufficient to take, say, uh, radical, there exists simple radical journal algebras. So, uh, for this algebra, we have uh, this stricting, uh, this, it doesn't lie in this. <coughs> uh, if J is finitely generated in PI, then both these algebras are PI for special and associative algebras approved by myself and for multiplicative by Yuri Medvedev. If J is solvable, then universal associative algebra is PI but uh, multiplicative enveloping algebra, maybe not PI. The both uh, algebras have natural uh, ascending filtrations, like in the case of E algebras. And one can consider the associative, associated graded algebras, graded for this algebra and graded for this algebra. These algebras, as usual, have more simple structure. In fact, the algebra, graded algebra for associative uh, universal algebra is just a homomorphic in, uh, image of the exterior or Grassmann algebra over the space J. Just tensor algebra factorized by all this ideal generated by this. And for multiplicative algebra, universal multiplicative algebra, the graded algebra is a homomorphic image of the quotient algebra of tensor algebra over this uh, ideal generated by all these so-called meson algebra, or partial case of so-called meson algebra, where T of J is a tensor algebra of the space J. Well, our objective is the study of the algebras, these graded algebras for free journal algebras. The structure of free journal algebra is quite complicated and has many open questions. For instance, there are no effective basis, no for free journal algebra with more than two generators. No, for free special journal algebra when it has more than three generators. Uh, that the free special journal algebra is just the subspace of Jordan elements in the free associative algebra. And no criterion are known to determine, to determine when a given element of free associative algebra is a Jordan one, contrary to the Lie algebra case, Lie elements. Another option, open question is the description of the kernel of the natural epimorphism from free journal algebras to free special journal algebras, the so-called S identities. Oh, so as, as I mentioned, we study the structure of this graded algebras for this universal enveloping algebras. Observe that uh, the universal enveloping algebra of free special journal algebra is just free associative algebra. So the first algebra, the first graded algebra is just the associated graded algebra of the free associative algebra with respect to the Jordan filtration. More exactly, for free special Jordan algebras, we have this ascending filtration where uh, JK is just a subspace of free associative algebra generated by all products of at most K Jordan elements. In this case, we have the following theorem. Let J be a free special journal algebra on N generators. Then the graded algebra is a sum of uh, these subspaces where these are generators in uh, uh, indices are strictly increasing and the last term is J. In particular, this algebra is nilpotent of degree N plus two. Uh, we don't know where the, the estimate n plus two in general case is exact. We have confirmed it for n equal to two by 
proving that x, y, j is not zero in the graded algebra for two generators when you take as j a square of commutator, it is your element. It follows from the following proposition. Let J be a Jordan element in two generators, uh, such that for which we have in the graded algebra, this equality zero. Then if you construct this element S of X, Y, Z, and J, uh, here commutator with Jordan product, commutator with Z, then this element is Jordan. And if we construct this expression, then it will be uh, this identity holds in the free Jordan algebra on three generated and three generators. Well, it's the proof it's quite easy. I, I, maybe I'll give it, we have this in, in the graded algebra, if and only if this tends, uh, Jordan product belongs to this uh, previous subspace. Applying the reversal involution, uh, since it, it is element is uh, skew symmetric, so it should be lie only in this subspace because element in J are symmetric. So assume that we have this equality. This is then the, this element when we construct S of X Y Z, it will have this form. It's it has this form, and it's Jordan element. Since it's uh, linear on Z. It depends on three elements and it's linear on Z. By Shershoff McDonald theorem, uh, we may consider this element in a free Jordan algebra, where it can be written in the following way. As this is correspond to inner derivations, for in derivation this. It's clear now that since it is derivation, we have this identity. It holds in all in free Jordan algebra. And so from this, we immediately have a color that it is not zero for this commutator because uh, some time ago, I have proved that if we substitute in the, instead of J this element, uh, then it is not zero in free Jordan algebra. In fact, it is an example of S identity, which uh, proportional to the well known so called Glenny identity. In fact, uh, Sergei Zhitkov proved that all S identities on three variables follow from this one. So, on this one. Uh, the sum in the theorem is in no way direct. It is interesting to investigate uh, the relations between the summons of the same degree. For instance, the relation between the summons of degree two are equivalent to the following equation in the free associative algebra on n generators uh, to find uh, uh, all solution F1, et cetera, et cetera Fn as, as a unknown uh, to find all the solution. Okay, uh, to solve this equation with respect to F1, et cetera, Fn in free associative algebra, these are known Jordan elements this. The solution of this equation in the free associative algebras can be obtained in the following way. Uh, a little higher, please. Let F be a monomial. Take a new variable z, z and consider the differential substitution of, uh, uh, well, in, instead of x i, substitute this variable z. Then f i can be written this way. Ah, well, the elements f i, if you change here, how to say, here, uh, z somewhere inside, but we have something like Trasmyslov did for his central polynomial. Just change V and U and consider this element which have degree uh, N minus one. Then this element will give a solution of the equation above. For example, let F be this element. Then we have substitution, uh, making substitution. We uh, differentiate by Z, but Y, and we have these two elements. And then we, consider this element, they, they, they will give solution of this equation, uh, this equation in free associative algebras. To get Jordan solution, one has to take element F to be Jordan. For instance, if we have this Jordan element, then we have Jordan solution which satisfies this equality. In the same way, by the way, taking F element, we contain a solution 
in for the free Lie uh, algebra on n generated. Observe that this equation in Lie algebra of two generates, it was investigated early by the paper of Remeslenikov and Stern. For relations of degree three, we have the, this equation more complicated for unknown Jordan elements, J, yeah, one, two, three. <laughs> it has many solutions. For instance, this is a solution, but we have no description of all solution in this case. It's also interesting to describe annihilators of the last term, uh, this element J, which produce annihilate this. Uh, for instance, in the case of two variables, we obtain a S identity, a new S identity. And also the famous tetrad eaters of Zelmanus uh, lie in this annihilator for all n more than equal to four. Uh, for the algebra, now I pass to, uh, pass to graded algebra for universal multiplicative algebra. We have an analog of the previous result is theorem two. Let J be a Jordan algebra, the free Jordan algebra and generators. Then the graded algebra of the universal multiplicative enveloping uh, is a sum of these subspaces. Here we have something like double. Uh, here the variables uh, have a growth of variables, but not uh, how to say they, uh, i's are growing and j's are growing, but they are just uh, mixed. Oh, i, j, i, j, j, and so on. And, the, and, and finally, only not only j, by two of them. And well, and here we identify element A and J with its image in the universal uh, in the law of multiplicative algebra. In particular, we have this uh, this algebra is nilpotent of this degree. In fact, this theorem, the nilpotency, was proved uh, before by Skasirsky, but he proved it for two n plus four. In fact, uh, they, uh, in fact, it's nilpotent of index two. And plus three. We don't know again whether this estimate is strong, strong even for n equal to two. In this connection, we formulate a question: Is it true that this is zero in uh, for Jordan algebra for general in two generators, where J again is a square of commutator? We don't know. More generally, it would be interesting to look for annihilators again of the last term here. That is on the elements A, I, B, I, and J that do not depend on the, uh, the first uh, generators and satisfy this equality, that such that they annihilate this expression. This is related in particular with description of the center of free Jordan algebra, since an element of the center annihilate the whole graded algebra. Uh, image of the center annihilate this graded algebra. Till now, there are no concrete examples of elements from the center, though it is known that this center is non-trivial for n sufficiently big. Well, and the currently we have that if M a Jordan model with a set X of generators or N generated Jordan algebra, then M uh, starting with the set of generators can be obtained at this, this final sum. In general, because of no associativity, we have a, we need an infinite number of summons, but for n generated journals, we have this finite sum. Okay, I believe my time is over. Oh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Shistaka, for your talk. Some questions, comments on the talk? Um, I was wondering if you take the homomorphism from the free Jordan algebra to the uh, free special Jordan algebra and take its kernel, is that finitely based or something? I mentioned already, it's so called the set of S identities. Uh, this kernel is described in the case of three generators. It generated by an element which I showed in the first. Uh, after the first theorem, in the case of three generators. Yeah. Uh, in the case of when we have more than three generators, 
only this example of this S identity. There are no, uh, it is not, there is no description, no examples. And even we don't know whether this, well, of course it is the IT ideal. We don't know whether it is finitely generated as a, a T ideal. Yeah, that's what I was talking. Thank you. Beautiful talk. Thank you. Some other questions? Are there any? If uh, not, let uh, thank again to Professor Shestakov. And the next speaker for today is Plamen Koev from San Jose State University. His talk is be diagonal decompositions of singular totally non-negative matrices. Please, Plamen Koev. Uh, thank you. And uh, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Vesco for inviting me to this and most importantly for uh, the great uh, collaboration and friendship, which has endured way past our relationship as uh, advisor and advisee. And I realize I may be uh, the only one of uh, his uh, colleagues and students that sort of uh, defected to another area, although it's still uh, uh, matrix computations, uh, but it's uh, now more, uh, it's a numerical analysis. And uh, so I apologize for this uh, late change in my talk, but I, after looking at all the other uh, talks, I realized that it's a heavy ring theory crowd. And uh, so I decided to talk about something that is a lot more related to, to, um, to, to everybody's interest other than to talk about convergence of eigenvalues. And uh, so it's something that, I, that has been uh, increasingly clear for, for me in uh, teaching numerical analysis over the, uh, in matrix computations over the years is that uh, one of the main troubles with uh, matrix algebras is the matrices don't commute. Um, and if they did commute, we wouldn't be really talking about uh, um, um, uh, matrix analysis as much as we do. Uh, but it turns out that in uh, numerical linear algebra, when you start computing with uh, matrices, uh, they uh, almost commute in, in a very interesting sense. This is why the, the second uh, subtitle of, of my talk is that the, the trick to most uh, computations is to sort of uh, not exactly commute the matrices, but make them almost commute. I'll uh, I'll explain what this means. The uh, uh, so the, the main result that I'll present today is that uh, is how to compute by diagonal decompositions of totally non-negative matrices. Uh, what this means, especially when they're singular. So um, a, a totally non-negative matrix. I'll explain is a matrix all of whose minors are non-negative. It includes uh, generalized Vandermonde matrices such as the one here. So if X is zero here, so we have zeros on the first and second rows, so how do you eliminate this matrix? So what do you do? And uh, it turns out this is an important question. So you wouldn't want to eliminate it if you're solving a linear system, for example. Uh, but if the goal of uh, the whole thing is to compute eigenvalues for singular values, uh, then uh, the singularity isn't uh, really relevant and it's very legit. So it has zero eigenvalues, uh, no problem at all. And uh, so how do you do this? So this is a part of a very general situation for uh, totally non-negative matrices. And, uh, but before I talk, start talking about this, let me just uh, go back a little bit about uh, why we care about uh, matrix decompositions and um, so in, in computing with matrices. So uh, the goals of uh, all matrix computations is to either solve a linear system and, uh, or an eigenvalue problem. And so, People often ask me whether we can make a career out of make uh, out of solving AX equals B and AX equals lambda X. And the answer is yes, so long as you have a computer uh, that has problems with rounding errors, you can absolutely do this. Then the, um, so the, the, the goal here in solving either the, these equations is, is to uh, factor the, this matrix A into simpler matrices. And these are usually either triangular, orthogonal, bidiagonal, and it's much easier to solve with these uh, with these matrices. And uh, so it's, it's somehow the matrix has to be factored into these and then dealing with the individual factors uh, becomes easier. Now, the problem with this uh, decomposition, whatever you compute, whether it's um, LU or whatever, is that the, uh, the factors don't always necessarily um, uh, the, uh, come in the right order. 
So, so you factor however you will. And sometimes you have a situation where it's like, maybe you have three factors like A times B times C. But what you really want, you want like some of these factors to be in the opposite order. You really want uh, B times A times C. So uh, this isn't possible, of course, but uh, what it is possible is to compute new matrices, so A1 and B1, such that this A, B, C will be actually equal to some B1, A1, and C, um, but where A1 and B1 are not exactly going to be uh, A and B, uh, but are they're going to have the same structure and uh, not only have the same structure, but sometimes be even better than the original A and B in the sense that uh, maybe the, the computation will have converged to a solution a little bit uh, farther. So um, here's a, an example of how this works and I'll walk you through the, uh, 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 well, let me restart this. So here's what happens uh, in a very familiar uh, situation where you have uh, Gaussian elimination with pivoting. This is how I uh, teach this. I'll walk you through this process to illustrate this is exactly what is happening. The goal is to cure, is to compute an LU decomposition. Again, it's a known example. It is very informative in what I uh, have in mind with uh, uh, commuting the, the factors to the, to the right place. So if you wanted to eliminate this, this matrix here and uh, so create zeros here, here, and here, uh, we first pivot, that is bring the largest element, which is this minus two, we bring it to first position by using a permutation matrix. And then of course, now this uh, negative two is exactly where we want it. And we subtract multiples of this negative two to kill the, uh, the, this one and negative one. And it's the, the uh, permutation matrix sits in front. And then we have the beginnings of the, the factor L and, uh, and this is the, new, the, the two zeros that we've already created. Now, trouble comes on the next step here is that the, now again, we want to eliminate this part of the matrix. Now, now we have this two here, which is larger than the one. So this two needs to move to position one. And, the, uh, and the, in order to do this, of course, we need to use a permutation matrix. And this is the permutation matrix, which moves this two to, to position two, two, exactly where we want it. Uh, and, uh, and, and everything is great, except that now this permutation matrix, we really want it to be married to, to this one here. We really don't want it uh, like a, a matrix, uh, then a part of L, then another permutation matrix and a part of U, because for larger matrices, it'll, this will keep getting worse and worse. And so, so we really want to take this matrix and somehow move it over here. So ideally what we'll do is, the, uh, is just swap these. Of course, we can just swap these. And uh, so we, what I say is we walk this matrix from here to here by first multiplying it uh, uh, to, to this one. So we form this, this product here, which destroys the lower triangular structure of the, uh, of the factor L. But then we can factor Again, a permutation of so, uh, this matrix on the right permute, uh, permutes the, the last two columns. Of course, this is what happens here. But then if you were to permute the last two rows again uh, on the next step, we can factor the, the, the matrix on the left and then restoring the lower triangular structure of, uh, the, of this matrix that will become L here. And for all practical purposes, um, we've moved this matrix from here to here. So this matrix, uh, I mean, it's not exactly the same as this one. So the 0 0.5 and the negative 0 0.5, they swap places as you can see, but for all practical purposes, this is some L1. This is just as good as, just as the L that we started here. Still lower triangular, no problem to, com to complete the uh, process of Gaussian elimination. And now this is a nice permutation matrix that sits in front. And of course, in the next step, you just eliminate the, the zero here and here's the P, L and U. So depending on which textbook you, you open, the different uh, things will show up. But this is uh, one of these examples where I say you, you have a, um, um, a, a matrix that is in the wrong place and, the, and then you move it through the decomposition to where you really want it. So, the, um, so this, is, this is a similar situation with many algorithms in numerical linear algebra. It happens in the, when you compute um, eigenvalues with the QR algorithm. So first, what you start with a matrix, you compute its QR decomposition, you multiply the factors in the opposite order. So you compute RQ, and then you compute the QR decomposition of this 
uh, of this matrix. And uh, so it, uh, so essentially this Q is in sort of in the wrong place and you kind of need to move it to, 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 to the other side by computing it, the QR, the, comp the composition of, uh, of, of this factor. Uh, this is the story also with the LR, the um, algorithm for computing uh, eigenvalues where you start with a matrix that is uh, decomposed as uh, in the tridiagonal case, product of two bidiagonals. And, uh, and you really um, want it to, uh, and, and you can multiply them in the wrong order, and then you compute the, uh, the, the decomposition. So you start with uh, BB transpose, and you, uh, you really want to move this one over to, to, to this side. And you um, and uh, so so this is a common uh, uh, um, trait that I've sort of I mean I don't want to say discovered but observed in the um, when computing with matrices and it's one that is very uh, useful when computing with um, totally non-negative matrices. So the totally non-negative matrices uh, form what amounts to an octant uh, in uh, n square space. Um, they're um, called totally non-negative. If all of their minors are non-negative of, of every order, I think there's what two to the n, four to the n minors. There's a lot of minors to check. Uh, there's faster ways to check whether a matrix is uh, totally uh, non-negative, but essentially if you erase any rows and columns. Um, they don't have to be um, uh, contiguous, and then the resulting uh, matrix uh, has a determinant that is uh, non-negative. So Vandermond, Hilbert, Pascal are such examples of uh, of matrices, very famous, and, and again. In terms of uh, sheer uh, space that they uh, um, take up in the space of matrices, it's an n square space um, when they're parameterized uh, properly. There's a long list here of, of, of matrices that are just like this. So I'll just leave the list here. And all of their, they share the property that uh, not only are they um, uh, totally non negative, uh, but there's formulas that we have, explicit formulas that are very, um, that are well known. Uh, for their what amounts to um, their by diagonal decompositions, and um, and I'll explain how this this works. But the, with the reason why I worked on with totally po positive matrices and totally non negative matrices for years, is that it is possible to do um, all linear algebra with them uh, very accurately um, to essentially most uh, digits that the computer will permit, all in floating po point arithmetic, the same cost in terms of arithmetic operations that you'd. Uh, so have to spend on any uh, operation anyway, and you just get the accurate results. It can be eigenvalues, uh, singular value decompositions, and also other decompositions. The latest result is that we can even compute the uh, Jordan blocks, uh, uh, which correspond to, uh, to zero eigenvalues, and uh, uh, which I was particularly excited about. And um, so the, um, the trouble there is that um, in order to, to, to deal with these matrices, uh, you need to... Uh, Present them properly to the uh, to the computer. So um, all of these uh, properties that are very useful in mathematics that say, "Hey, look, I mean, we have a matrix that satisfies such and such inequality or such and such property." It is impossible to explain this to a computer. So so if you if you want to present, for example, to a computer uh, a, a number that is non-negative, um, never mind matrices for a second. So if you want to say, "Hey, look, we have a." Uh, um, a, a, a non-negative number. So it is better to simply ask uh, the, the computer, uh, for the computer to ask for a number, which is the square root of, of that number. So, so you can input any, any number you like. Uh, it can be positive or negative. Uh, then the computer takes this number and squares it. And that's how you know that anything that you input will be um, non-negative. So similarly, if you have a matrix, for example, which is uh, positive definite, uh, then, uh, I mean, in order for it to be positive definite, it's a bunch of inequalities, uh, which the computer has no way of checking or knowing what those mean. Uh, mean we know what these mean because we can write it on paper, but it's much easier if you have a, a positive definite matrix to say, hey, look, here is the Kuleski factor. And if you give the Kuleski factor, then the computer knows. Okay, so I'll work with the Kuleski factor, then it definitely the matrix. If it has the Kuleski factor, and here it is, this is the proof. So you need to prove to the computer that this is, this is indeed the matrix that you supply. So it turns out that with the totally non-negative matrices, it's a, um, it's a similar story, except that you have to provide what amounts to bidiagonal decomposition, which is the composition, uh, again, in, uh, into bidiagonal factors. It is something that is similar to Gaussian elimination, except that it's, instead of lower triangular factors, you get these bidiagonals. 
And the reason why you get by diagonal is because you eliminate the matrix using adjacent rows. So for example, you create a zero here where the 28 is by multiplying the second, the second, not the first row, was a pivot row, but you multiply the second row by seven and you subtract it from the, uh, from the third to create the seven. Then you use the first to, 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 to create the zero where the four is. And then you uh, create a zero where whatever number appeared here. And these are the factors that happen in this composition. So um, it turns out that this is a great composition to have um, in terms of uh, it uh, just sheer uh, mathematics and perturbation theory that the uh, theory says that if this matrix is uh, totally non-negative, then all of these red numbers need to be, uh, the non-trivial um, elements of this decomposition need to be non-negative. Then the, uh, on the other side, if these are non-negative, the matrix is uh, totally non-negative. And this is just Cauchy Binet. So if you think of, so each bidiagonal uh, on that non-negative bidiagonal has all of its minors non-negative, you use Cauchy Binet to form this product, any minor here will be just a sum of positive uh, minors. And uh, so this is very, um, uh, so this is the starting point. So for all the algorithms that compute with the totally non-negative matrices, the assumption is, it's not that you provide the matrix. The computer has no way of checking if it's totally non-negative, but you provide these, all these red numbers, which are exactly the n squared parameters, which, which parameterize the space of totally non-negative matrices. And then you operate it with these uh, matrices. And uh, for uh, those of you that have taken interest in numerical analysis, uh, you have learned that uh, if you never subtract, if you only add and multiply and divide, uh, then uh, round off errors are not a problem. It's exactly what happens. And um, you compute eigenvalues, SVDs and, uh, and whatnot. Everything is very accurate and very nice. Now, um, the, the big, the question of course here is like, well, we have a Vandermon matrix, we have a Cauchy matrix, we have whatever matrix, how do we get this decomposition? So luckily uh, some uh, other mathematicians have done that job for us ahead of time. And uh, so I'll start with what is probably the simplest example, but it's very uh, illustrative of, uh, of the situation. You open the books and here's the Vandermon matrix. And it turns out that it has a bidiagonal decomposition that is very well know, known and very well understood. And uh, the trouble with this decomposition is that, um, that if the X and Y, for example, are the same, uh, something that causes no problem in the matrix itself. So the Vandermond matrix will be perfectly well-defined. It'll clearly be singular. It'll have a zero eigenvalue here, uh, but this decomposition doesn't work with uh, when uh, X is equal to, uh, to, to Y. So we have this uh, the denominator here, which, uh, is uh, an artifact of the decomposition. It has nothing to do with the matrix. It, this, this is not defined for X is equal to Y, uh, but this matrix clearly is. Not only this, you really don't want denominators of this form because when X starts getting closer to Y, then this number will explode. So um, I set out to see, well, can we eliminate these, uh, these denominators out of these decompositions? Now, for three by three case, this is a fairly straightforward uh, situation where you literally you take the diagonal factor here and you multiply it by this factor and this Y minus X will multiply into the second column clearly of this matrix. will create something here, but it will definitely kill the Y minus X here and there will be no trouble. Uh, this is just for three by three. And um, the situation is how do, is the question is how do we make this work for larger ones? So for larger ones, it's uh, this is the four by four case. And it's once again, a situation where you need to walk your, uh, uh, your diagonal factor. So I only took these, these middle ones, the upper triangular factors are real, irrelevant. There's no singularities there. So you just take the, the, the earlier ones for the four by four case. And uh, you have the diagonal matrix D here that uh, we're going to walk through the, this decomposition and leave factors and cancel things as needed. So the so on the first uh, step, you take the, uh, the these these factors, you multiply here, and we get rid of all the denominators. This y minus x is going to take care of this y minus x. This z minus x, z minus y is going to kill this here, and then we're going to end up with this entire thing uh, down here. Now the, the diagonal matrices don't commute with uh, um, with other matrices, but uh, you it sort of leaves its mark on this matrix and, and leaves it better. So now out of this matrix, out of the left, we'll factor everything that we can. So we factor the Z minus Y here out of the second row and this entire T minus Z, T minus Y out of the third row. 
we factor it out. So now we have, we leave this one matrix better. So, so we had a, let's call this matrix L and a D. Now we have some D1 and L1. And now, now this L1 is actually much better than the L that we started with. And then we have a diagonal factor here, which clearly just like in the three by three case, very nicely kills the, uh, 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 the, uh, the 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 remaining the denominator you can factor it out one more time the t minus z out of the left so that everything looks nice and symmetric and you end up with a matrix that is much more um, uh, the composition that is much nicer here so so look for three by three like the factors you don't have complicated products here these are just nice uh, things the, the the diagonal factor is actually the identity so so if you'd like you can even like say that it's not even there and you produce uh, situations like this, where now all of a sudden, so, so the same idea works in all of this long list of classes that we had before. And then the, um, uh, so now with uh, Cauchy, Lupus, whatever matrices, and now you can compute um, uh, eigenvalues very nicely for singular matrices. And this is one example where you have a animal matrix, uh, matrix with uh, multiple nodes, uh, like the three is, is repeated three times, the eight is repeated uh, uh, five times, and uh, and so you get uh, only 12 non-zero eigenvalues that you can see that will all be accurate. You see the deterioration happening below the round off for the conventional algorithms, and this is a log log plot here, so we don't have the zero eigenvalues that will be somewhere on the bottom, but you can compute things like this now. So uh, so this is it. This is what I've been doing with my knowledge of matrix uh, analysis, and uh, thank you so much for the invitation and for the opportunity to present here. Thank you, Plamen, for your talk. Some questions? Thank you. Comments? Talk for today is of Dimitrinka Vladeva from the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences. The title of the talk is Derivations and Automorphisms of the Endomorphism Semi-Ring of an Infinite Chain. Please, Dimitrinka Vladeva. Uh, thanks. <clears throat> we thank the organizers for the opportunity to participate in this important conference. And we special uh, thank to Akademishan Drensky for an inspiring example for a researchers, uh, a researcher, a good friend and a correct colleague. And introduction. The study of derivations uh, in semirings has a short history. In A, Canadian linguist Gabriel Thierry first considers differential semirings. He proved that the same rings of languages over some alphabet forms and additively idempotent same rings under the operations of union and uh, as the addition and catenations as a product. The endomorphism same rings of uh, semi lattice are well established. Uh, the first author investigated derivations in endomorphism semirings of affinity chain CB and C, the authors obtained some results for nilpotent and idempotent elements of the endomorphisms uh, endomorphism semirings of an unfined change with less element. Some preliminaries. And relatively idempotent semirings S uh, with plus and uh, multiply uh, is an additive identifying a Bayer semi group S and multiplicative monoid S with identity satisfying the usual distributive laws. For a joint semi lattice <coughs> M, uh, join the map alpha uh, from M to M is called endomorphism if alpha from his uh, from x join y is equal to alpha from x uh, join alpha from i from <coughs> any x and i 
belongs M. The set epsilon of the endomorphisms of M is an additively idempotent semiring with respect to the addition and multiplications defined with these equalities. Most of endomorphism semirings of affinite or an unf unfinite chain and also a semiring investigated in A are semirings S without zero but with identity one. In the set Z of integers, we consider the binary operation. Uh, one <coughs> K uh, uh, from L, its maximum, where uh, K uh, and L belongs Z. Then Z with this operation is an infinite chain without last element. A map alpha such that uh, uh, alpha from K uh, join. join L is equal to alpha from K join alpha from L is called Z endomorphism. Uh, the idea of studying such endomorphisms was suggested by academician Dransky in the annual meeting of uh, Imiban of the end of 20. 18. It follows that alpha, uh, which is maximum of uh, uh, this uh, <coughs> uh, alpha k and alpha l, uh, and uh, if uh, k is uh, less than or equal of l, uh, then e this inequality called uh, this uh, we uh, are called uh, uh, is an order preserving map. Any Z endomorphisms alpha can be expressed by the images alpha from K, uh, alpha K, where K belongs to Z. Uh, this sequence alpha briefly we write alpha K. K belongs Z. The integers alpha K are called coordinates of the Z endomorphisms in morphism alpha. In the set epsilon Z uh, consisting of Z endomorphism, we define the operations from alpha and beta uh, in this way. It is easy to prove that uh, this set is an additively idempotent semiring. The identity map Y such that uh, from K is equal K, for all K uh, it is the identity of epsilon Z. The endomorphism alpha is called an increasing if uh, A K plus 1 is uh, greater than a k for h k belongs to z. The identity i is an increasing endomorphism. The set of the increasing endomorphisms of z f of epsilon z is denoted by i epsilon z. From y and two, it follows that some uh, product of increasing endomorphisms are also increasing. Hence, the set of increasing endomorphisms is a sub of epsilon. The endomorphisms which are increasing can be described as follows. Uh, the endomorphism alpha belongs to I epsilon Z and only if it has a right inverse. Jacobson proved the next theorem and noted that this result was proved firstly by Kaplansky using structure theory. Mm, it is theorem. Derivations. We define a map delta L uh, from uh, I epsilon Z to I 
epsilon z such that for any endomorphism alpha uh, delta l from alpha k is equal to a k plus one proposition two the map delta l is a derivation in a semi ring i z i epsilon z since uh, delta l from uh, identity is equal to k plus one it follows that uh, delta l from i is equal to delta l from alpha uh, it means that any left ideal from the semi ring i epsilon z is closed under the derivations delta l Deriv for the positive powers of the derivations we prove the next theorem the map uh, mt, pa mt degree the m degree of delta l uh, where m is a positive integer is the derivations in semi ring uh, in this semi ring uh, let sl be the subset of uh, uh, this semi ring consisting of the endomorphism alpha such that i uh, is less or equal alpha from uh, and uh, to uh, i is uh, less and equal beta uh, it follows that it means that i is uh, uh, two uh, less or equal alpha plus beta and uh, and uh, i is equal uh, uh, or less than alpha uh, beta from alpha then uh, in this uh, mean that uh, S uh, is a subsemering of uh, subsemering of uh, I epsilon Z. Uh, uh, from this e inequality, uh, it's uh, holds that alpha is uh, less and or equal uh, to alpha in power 2 but from uh, this uh, using proposition 1 it holds that uh, i is uh, less or equal to alpha and this means that the semi ring s is consi consisting of the endomorphism alpha such that uh, it uh, is true in uh, these elements are called almost idempotent. Uh, the authors characterized the subsemering generated by the set of all almost idempotent elements of K regular additively idempotent semering. Now we define the similar map uh, delta L such that for any alpha it follows that uh, delta r alpha from k is equal to alpha k minus 1 for all k from z. Proposition 3. The maps delta r is derivation in uh, uh, i epsilon z. Uh, any right ideal of the same ring is closed under the derivations delta r. For the positive powers of the derivations delta r, we can prove uh, that the map delta r uh, in degree m, uh, where m is a positive integer, is a derivation in semi-ring uh, i epsilon z. Let s be the subset of i epsilon z consisting of the endomorphism alpha such that alpha is less than or equal i <laughs> and uh, from this uh, we prove the same as a uh, uh, previous case and uh, proposition for uh, holds that the semi ring sr of i epsilon z is an incline uh, from the definition of delta r alpha 
um, delta L alpha and delta R alpha and the proofs of theorem 1 and 2, it follows that for any alpha and M greater than or equal to, we have these inequalities. Let S be a semi ring and X uh, uh, belongs to S and uh, delta X to S is a derivation. Following uh, pressure, uh, we say that delta is commuting on x. If delta x uh, by x is equal x by delta x for all x uh, from x. All derivations considered by authors for endomorphism summary of a finite chain or of infinite chain with layers element are commuting. But in this case, uh, if we uh, get alpha to be 2k uh, mm -hmm. plus 1 and delta L be <coughs> 2k plus 3 and delta R 2k, uh, we can calculate that uh, it is not commuting deri derivation. Uh, it is a contraexample that uh, in this uh, set is community. Mm. Uh, uh, the derivation delta L and delta R commute, but it is uh, 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 delta L and delta R is equal to delta R uh, delta R delta L from alpha. For any alpha, we can obtain these inequalities. Proposition 6. The, products, uh, the product of derivations delta R and delta R is an automorphism of the semi ring I epsilon Z. Surprisingly, the automorphism has the following separating property. For an arbitrary alpha and beta, it follows that delta L, delta R from alpha multiply beta is equal to delta L alpha multiply delta R beta. Now we define the map delta L minus 1 such that for any endomorphism alpha, alpha K, it follows that delta L minus 1 is equal to a k minus 1 for all k. Evidently, uh, that uh, uh, delta L minus 1 from delta L is equal to delta L from delta L minus 1, and it is equal to alpha. Inverse. Since the cut uh, coordinate of delta R uh, from uh, I is L. Uh, is a k minus 1. It follows that uh, delta L minus 1 from alpha is equal to delta R i from alpha. Uh, the delta R minus 1 is a linear map, but it is not a derivation. We have only delta R minus 1 alpha uh, product of alpha beta is equal delta L minus 1 from alpha uh, product beta. In particular, delta L minus 1 alpha is equal to delta L minus 1 from I alpha. Hence, any left ideal of the same ring is closed under the map delta L minus 1. Uh, we define uh, the, uh, a right? map delta L minus 1 Basically. such that for any endomorphism uh, alpha it follows that delta R minus 1 alpha from K is equal a K plus 1 for all K from Z and uh, this is the uh, uh, similar as uh, in previous case uh, it is true that this 
uh, corollary for uh, identity i uh, and arbitrary alpha, it follows uh, this uh, property. And proposition uh, 8, the maps delta L minus 1 and delta R minus 1 commute to uh, now I, I, we can extend the, inequ the equality for and uh, uh, for these uh, inequalities. But the similar reasoning we uh, can obtain the following result. For an arbitrary integer m, the map delta L delta R in power n is an automorphism of the same ring I epsilon Z. For the elements of the infinite cyclic group generated by the automorphism delta L delta R, we find inequality similar to this. Since uh, A K plus M minus M uh, is less than or equal uh, A K plus M plus 1, minus m, minus 1 for any m from z. Uh, yes. Uh, same ring so of uh, derivations and automorphism. Uh, in this section, uh, we shall construct uh, a few new derivations. Uh, in the definitions of all these derivations, we use an increasing sequence kappa and prove that the set of all derivations for all configuration kappa are an additively idempotent same rings. Uh, if we fix the configuration kappa, the set of derivations is a sub ring of the previous same ring. And uh, every of these cases is uh, uh, considered uh, consequently. Uh, yes, the map DL uh, is a derivation in uh, I epsilon Z. The set of derivations delta L of the type 7, and this is. Uh, uh, the definition uh, denoted uh, the set of this de denoted by uh, DL. Let DL at no and DL V from DL uh, the derivations with different configurations, and let KN be a configurations of DL1 and hash1, hash2, and hash3 be the jump points of. DL2, which are consecutive terms of the given configurations of DL2. And let these points be consecutive terms of the sequence KN, such that these inequalities hold. And then for alpha, we can define the sum of uh, this uh, D and uh, there is uh, two another possibilities for the jump points of the derivation uh, DL1 and DL2. Case 1, some of the numbers H1, H2, and H3 are jump points of DL1, and uh, case 2, between two of numbers H1, H2, and H3, there are no jump points of DL1. Uh, in these cases, uh, we uh, can prove uh, this result. Uh, configurations of the map DL1 and DL2 uh, is a part of the union of jump points of this. Uh, it is possible some of the jump points of DL1 and DL2 to be points of zero jump of the sum, for example, and we, in this, that is uh, called, the points H1 is the point of zero jump of uh, this sum. 
the product of derivations the L1 and uh, the L2 defined similarly. Uh, let us suppose that the jump points of the derivations are arranged in the, uh, this uh, way. Uh, in this, we can uh, prove that uh, uh, dl1 multiply dl2 uh, belongs to dl and any two derivations commute. And this, we have proved this theorem. The set of derivations dl is a commutative additively idempotent semiring. For the last theorem, it follows the that any left ideal of the same ring is closed under an arbitrary derivation DL from DL. And the set of derivations DL kappa for an arbitrary configuration kappa is a sub ring of DL. And uh, analogously, we construct a map uh, dr. Uh, let kt, kt plus 1 and kt plus 2 uh, be jump points of dr, which are consecutive numbers of the fixed configurations of dr. Then, for an arbitrary endomorphism and integer e, we can define uh, this uh, dr alpha from my, uh, where m kt and mkt plus 1 are non-negative integers such that uh, this hold. Uh, Sorry to remind you that the pointed uh, time is uh, already yes. up. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, the last theorem is that the set of uh, derivations delta R is a commutative additively identical semering. Uh, and proposition 10, the set of derivations uh, delta R kappa for any arbitrary configurations kappa is the sub ring of delta R. Is that uh, yes. Mm, to be ma By analogous con uh, construction, we consider an automorphism uh, ALR and uh, kappa is the same uh, as uh, this is uh, the construction, the definition of uh, A. And uh, <coughs> finally, theorem is uh, the set of automorph automorphisms, OTR L, is an additively idempotent semiring. And uh, proposition 12 the set of automorphisms for an arbitrary configuration kappa containing K0 K is a sub semi field of AOTLR. Mm. Thank you, Dimitrinka Vladeva, for your talk.